Okay, the meeting is up on YouTube. People are able to watch it at this point. Jeff, you've got a real uh, mission control voice going on there. <laughs> Very calming. That's because I don't have my video camera turned on. There's <laughs> nothing for me to be worried about. You say you say I should be worried. Very comforting. <laughs> <laughs> Makeup. <laughs> My shiny forehead does not need to appear on camera. Oh, don't start talking about foreheads, please. <laughs> You'll notice I didn't jump into the discussion about bangs. <laughs> Sound check, can anybody hear me? Yeah. Yeah, we got you, Peter. Okay. I'm just coming in by uh, phone. We've got uh, one Zoom uh, function site and uh, Galen's got that up and running. Okay, and we're live streamed on YouTube right now, Peter. Okay, thank you. I don't think my computer uh, uh, firewall will let me get that. But I'll check it out. Okay, we are one minute. We have six counselors here. Cindy, where are you? Her screen's up, so. I'm here, I see me. Great. We can't see you. I think you have your screen um, facing backwards. Oh. Wrong camera, there we go. Okay, got it. Okay, Helen, are you here? Okay. Congratulations, everyone. We are ready to start on time today. Our first Zoom meeting on time, so very happy about that. Okay, we will, it's two o'clock, so we will call to order our regular meeting of council and start by recognizing that we are holding our meeting mostly on the unceded territories of the Sashot and Hoopachesset First Nations. And of course, um, appreciating that um, other people may be calling into this meeting from other locations today. Um, councillors, are there any items to add to the agenda? No. Councillor Corbeil. Yes, Madam Mayor. I'm just wondering if we shouldn't discuss the uh, Canada Emergency Commercial Rental Assistance Program today, since it will have some, I think, implications on our budget process. Tim? Madam Mayor, there will be opportunity during um, at least two different reports from the Director of Finance to, um, to touch on that. And he, okay. he's prepared, prepared to update you on that. Perfect. Good. Thank you. Yes, uh, Madam Mayor, another thing that might implicate uh, for our budget too would be the um, transit because I believe the month is coming up and we need to talk about that too. Great, so we can address um, all budget items under the budget um, section that we have in our agenda today. So we don't need to make any additions to the agenda for that. Super, uh, thank you. Councillor Haggard. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I was wondering if we could get everybody to mute because it's starting to get very echoey. The noise. Thank you. Thank you. So if you're on and not speaking, please mute. Wonderful. Okay, thank you. And City Clerk, any items to add to our agenda? Uh, no late items, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Then would somebody like to move approval of our agenda? Moved so moved. by Councillor Solda, seconded by Councillor Poon. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. Okay. Okay, we have minutes from the special meeting of council held at 11.30 a.m. and the regular meeting of council held at 2 p.m. on April 14th, 2020. Would somebody like to move adoption? Move to adopt. Second. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Seeing none, all in favor. Carried. And that brings us to public input period, which is an opportunity for members of the public to address council on topics of relevance to city council. City clerk, have we received any public input? Just slightly. Uh, none, Madam Mayor. 
No. Uh, sorry, my apologies. I do have one from Roland Smith okay. for public input. So just on behalf of Roland Smith, reading today's agenda, the proposed resolution to my inquiry is for staff to respond in writing. Mayor and Council are the, the decision makers and staff carry out the directive. While some questions require detail that only staff can provide, my hope is the Council, the citizens of Port Alberni elected to make decisions, will also be the ones to provide answers to any questions of those decisions. Thank you for that. Is there any other input received? Nothing further. Thank you. Would you mind just doing a quick reminder to people of how they can submit input? Um, and again, that people can submit input for question period at the end of our meeting as well. Absolutely. Members of the public during the meeting are invited to submit any questions they may have to the email address council at portalburney.ca, at which time of the agenda when we get to questions from the public, they will be read out on your behalf. Thanks. And staff do monitor that throughout the whole meeting. So. Great, thank you. Okay, so that brings us to delegations. And we have one delegation today from the Alberni Valley Chamber of Commerce. We have Bill Collette here to discuss the Welcome Sign Project. Welcome, Bill. Hi. Thank you for Thanks. joining us. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry about that. My phone here is ringing. <laughs> Apologize for that. Never thought that would happen, but uh, there you go. I'm going to try and share my screen here. Sure. I'm going to have to let the phone ring through. That is no problem. If that's okay. Absolutely. Um, anyways, yes, thank you very much for, can you see my screen now? We can. Okay. Um, thank you very much for that. Let me just um, put it on slideshow here. That's probably what Councillor Paulson was looking at. There we go. Um, so we were um, asked by the um, city to do a little research on, um, on community signage. So we started that, uh, I guess, a couple of months ago now. So I'll work my way through this. Um, and in, within our, within our uh, report, we have a little bit of history of signs that um, have been discussed here in Port Alberni over the years. And we've also reached out to as many as we could on Vancouver Island and beyond um, to see what, uh, what they've done and how it was paid for, et cetera, et cetera. I'll, I'll mention right here at this point that uh, getting information was um, uh, rather challenging, and in some cases we, we, we failed. Um, um, it was quite surprising what is uh, not available in terms of uh, who paid and how much it costs and who developed it and that sort of thing. Uh, but we've got, uh, that said, we do have some, some good information that I think you'll appreciate. Um, back in about 1980, you see at the top of your screen the old focal point sign, that's what we've referred to it as. Um, that was here at the visitor center. And um, uh, that, you know, I've, I see lots of stuff on, on Facebook about that, as I'm sure you all do. And uh, that particular sign, uh, if you want to call it a sign, is still um, in town and it's been um, uh, refurbished, I believe, by the city. It, 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 uh, so it's still there, but I think for the purposes of, of the word signage, it's not really a sign. Um, it's unreadable from a distance. Um, so it's something, it's, it's a work of art is really what it is. Um, and I would certainly support uh, further conversation um, about that particular piece if, uh, if, if the city was interested in that. I have some ideas, um, um, you know, um, further to this that uh, we might wanna, might wanna discuss. Then in about uh, 2007, the bear tracks and lumberjacks thing came about. And uh, that was originally um, uh, started by Alberni Valley Tourism at the time, which I believe was part of the Chamber of Commerce back at that time. And um, you can see information on that in your October 7th, 2007 uh, minutes. Uh, you can take a look at that if, if, you're, if you wish to do so. 2015, there was an audit done by Vancouver Island students um, through the university there. And, uh, but they focused more on overall signage in the city and um, um, you know, signage such as the one we see uh, coming into town saying Port Alberni 16 kilometers away and that sort of thing. 
2016, there was a, um, uh, an opportunity to apply for projects within the city. Um, we did uh, here at the chamber and uh, our application was on community signage. And um, unfortunately that wasn't um, uh, supported it at the time, uh, but you know, we can see that signs have been um, under discussion for many years and, and we're certainly thrilled that the city is, uh, is looking at this uh, um, at this point in time. Um, and then uh, later that same year, the Johnson, Johnson Road charrette um, happened and uh, signage was a big part of that charrette. Um, and it was actually um, basically a charrette is an intensive study and that's what we did. I was part of that. Uh, probably many on council at the time were, were part of it as well and lots of the local business community. Um, and the, uh, the um, information received through that charrette was that the east entry welcome sign uh, along with median improvement was a, was a major focus. Um, and interesting, um, you know, the location of the sign uh, that was discussed in the charrette was um, really where, where there's been a lot of talk about uh, placing one and that's uh, right along Johnson Road. Um, and in the right near the Walmart location, which I believe is the, the start of the city boundary. So uh, the charrette, and, and I'm reminded of that when I started to review this, that that's what was uh, pointed out. And you'll see later on in here where there's at least one example that kind of echoes the, the logic behind that. So um, again, John Street, Johnson Road, is, it seems to be a, a really good location for the people arriving from the east. And the full report on that charrette is also available on the city website. Um, and then our proposal back in uh, 2016 for the, um, um, for the application that we did under a funding thing from Community Forest, this was one of the applications we received from a local sign company. Uh, it was quite impressive, quite well done. Uh, as you can see in the background, that, that was actually placed in front of the visitor center here. Um, although I always am challenged, what is the front of the visitor center? But the front in this purpose is the highway side of it, uh, not the parking lot side. So, um, but it was quite, a, quite an impressive thing. And I, I don't recall if there was any pricing established to that, but you can see it's pretty significant. This was another one that was received at the same time from a local artist. Um, <clears throat> we really liked it um, and the neat thing about it was at the time and, and when this visitor center was built um, there was desire uh, to have a, 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 a patio type concept out front so that people could walk through and sit there and have a coffee or whatever and look out at Mount Aerosmith and the traffic coming in and so on. So this sign was built along that theme. You can see it's actually a sit down um, venue almost and uh, this is the one we applied for the funding for and, and, and weren't, um, weren't successful. Uh, moving forward to some of the island ones that we um, uh, investigated, this particular one, Parksville, uh, I think we're all familiar with that sign that was initiated by the city of Parksville and the Parksville or district of uh, Parksville and district chamber of commerce. And, um, uh, the Converse uh, Chamber there donated uh, 25000 for it. And then there was a, a button raising, a button fundraising campaign that gen generated more money. Thrifty Foods put money into it. Uh, total budget of about $127,000. Uh, lovely sign. It's, it's really quite, quite nice. It really stands out. And one of the real attractive things about it is along the bottom there, they can promote uh, community events or, or whatever. Um, and they generate revenue by doing so. So it's, it's, a, it's a very good idea. And I believe the chamber there still runs and organizes that, uh, that sign and everything kind of flows through them. It was built in 2010. <clears throat> the one in Ladysmith, we had a little, a little more challenge getting uh, specific information on it, but you can see it was, it was produced by Chloe and Doak, um, whoever that is, I'm not familiar with them. Um, and, um, uh, but it was built in 2002. Uh, we don't know the cost of it, uh, but it is rather significant, I would imagine. Uh, funded by the town of Ladysmith and it, like, like it points out there, the budget's unconfirmed. Uh, 
This one in Fort St. John um, was built in 2018 by S. Young Enterprise Limited. Um, there's four separate uh, entry monument signs, so four different ones. And it was initiated by the city of Fort St. John. You can see it got funding from Tourism BC, Heritage Kiosk Program, Hospitality Program and Community Tourism Opportunities Grant. Um, they are approximately 2.4 to 5.3 meters, um, uh, meters wide and up to five meters tall. Um, over over $100,000 to construct that. The new spay, this is more of a simple sign, um, and uh, but it's uh, very effective. Um, it's uh, quite a nice sign and it's, um, it, it, I think it works quite well. It was uh, developed by Scott Signs there in uh, Parksville, uh, quite a progressive, uh, good organization, one on either side of, of uh, Nanus, and they were about 30,000 each, funded by the regional district of Nanaimo. And um, uh, you can see they're about 12 feet wide by 10 feet tall. Easy to spot, there's not much clutter around them, so uh, that's interesting where some of the other signs are positioned, there's, there's too much too much around them, you, you, you miss them. So they're quite effective. Squamish, um, the first phase, August 2017. Um, and an interesting in Squamish, they, um, they, they really struggled uh, the same way we did in terms of investigating and how they um, could develop their signage. So um, you can see that they had about a $100,000 budget uh, but information on final costs are not available, so, so we couldn't get that. Um, this particular article was in the Squamish Chief, uh, May 14th, 2015. So the three um, quotes there are taken right from that article, and um, um, just the one on the top left there, other communities have had their signs for so long, no one can remember when they were erected or how much they cost. Staff at City of, of Duncan can't recall when the signs were put in there, but it was before the 1980s, the spokesperson said. So that was specific to Duncan. Um, you can see the one next to it, uh, public outcry, which is rather interesting. And, um, uh, but public outcry, um, because there was an initial budget of about $100,000. Uh, but the, the one on the bottom is quite interesting. Uh, and I think it's really important. Entrance signs are important important to a community brand according to the 2007 report. And it goes on to say that municipal signs and community entrance signs are, they provide distinctive um, um, information on, I can't read it there because um, Helen's in the way, um, uh, but they allow a community to enable, enable themselves or identify themselves and welcome visitors and uh, which I think is really important. Uh, Nanaimo, it's, uh, those are huge signs. We've all seen those signs for sure. Uh, I, I doubt if anybody could say they've never seen the Nanaimo sign. So they're very, very effective, one on each end of town. Um, a lot of the funding came from Woodgrove Mall, um, which I think was logical for them to, uh, to do that. And, uh, but you can see big dollars involved there, but not surprising. Uh, Whistler, they had about a $78,000 budget for a new sign in 2013. And uh, that figure included concrete and wood electrical costs and about 15,000 for landscaping. Um, and they did reuse some, some of the product from the former sign. City of Vancouver, um, their signage was all done internally through their own fabrication department, uh, but they really couldn't confirm what the real cost of it was either. But, um, you know, they were a they, large city, obviously, they were able to do it themselves. And, and so that's what their signs look like. Uh, Salmon Arm budgeted about 120,000 in, in 2007 for the two entrance signs. Uh, the exact figure is not known, but about 60,000 came from uh, UBCM, uh, the Community Tourism Fund. Tofino, um, uh, we couldn't get information on Tofino and, and last we tried, um, uh, it was just too, too much involved in this whole COVID thing. So um, uh, we weren't able to um, gain any extra knowledge on that, but uh, we're familiar with that sign. And again, it's, it's quite effective. 
Uh, Kuala Kam Beach, I know the uh, um, uh, chief financial officer there quite well, John Marsh, friend of mine. Um, and, uh, but he had no idea what the costs were for, for their sign. But uh, this one is well positioned when you're coming from the Parksville side, it points people towards village center and along the, uh, along the um, highway front. So it's, uh, it's quite, a, quite a good sign, I think, and it, it works well for them. But again, they have no idea of its cost or when it was constructed. This one here, uh, so Duncan, as, I, as you heard earlier, it was built around the 1980s, so it's quite a long time ago, 40 years. Um, I had a hard time finding it. And um, um, driving, driving through the highway, I had to stop a couple of times to find it. And the problem there is that uh, their sign is, is mixed in with all of the billboards as you approach Duncan from the south. And um, I know that I'd even been a proponent of a sign here and I can see where uh, that would have been a problem um, because of, again, of all the, um, uh, of all the uh, billboards in the vicinity here, um, it would reduce the effectiveness of a, of a sign. So, um, and, and Duncan just really, really emphasized that for me as to, as to the, the fact that their sign is completely lost, whether it's older or not, it's, it's lost. You, you, you have a hard time finding it. So again, that aligns really well with the Charette report here uh, that suggests our, our sign should be at the boundary of, of uh, Port Alberni. Um, City of Nelson, their sign is interesting. It was actually repurposed or uh, a local artist had done one years ago and uh, it got pre pretty much worn out. So they basically just um, redid it, um, reconstructed the original design. It's very simple design. Um, they don't know the actual cost, but um, it's effective and it, it works for them. Uh, Terrace, this is another one that uh, emphasizes uh, why um, some of the thought of uh, Johnson and, and John makes sense. Uh, they had to relocate their sign, uh, largely because the original Terrace sign was in the regional district. And um, um, so there, there became a problem because of that. Um, so um, um, again, it sort of emphasizes why the signage, you know, it's, it's a good idea to have it uh, very, very close to the boundary of, of the city. Um, but um, anyway, so this particular one is a nice uh, effective sign that's, uh, like I say, it's been repositioned or redeveloped uh, pretty much at the border of the city. Uh, Comox Valley sign has received a lot of favorable response. It serves three communities. Uh, all three participated in it. And um, um, again, it's a sign that's very effective. I'm sure every one of us here have seen that sign countless times. Revelstoke, um, theirs was the, by far the most elaborate one that we discovered. Um, it, um, and, and, and they redid their signage because of signage clutter. Um, and and uh, so they, they went through a whole process and, and redid everything in the community, uh, hired a, an outside consulting firm, and uh, they spent a ton of money on it. And, um, um, and they really rebranded the, the whole thing. So, um, you know, that's something um, that while it's impressive, it's, it's probably not within our city's uh, budget or focus, but it was still kind of interest, interesting to see what they've done. Uh, this slide here shows one of the three concepts they came up with. This particular one focuses on heritage in, in uh, Revelstoke. And so they've, you've obviously got the main entrance sign and then the various different ones throughout the community. And um, again, this particular uh, vision is uh, um, on the heritage side. Um, and um, so they, they went through all of that. Um, I don't have to go through all of this, but um, you know they were looking at navigation and that sort of thing. And, and uh, so again, it was quite elaborate. Uh, they had three different concepts. So they had a mountain concept, uh, mountain and views and heritage. And the one I just showed was the heritage. Um, and uh, you know they determined that wayfinding must be separate from commercial signage. And, and their, their discovery was rather alarming. When you look at some of the pictures, they would have a, a wayfinding sign right beside a, uh, a sign that pointed to a, a local grocery store or whatever. So, um, and, and that was 
uh, very common in, in Revelstoke. And uh, chances are it's common here too, and we may not have even looked at that, but um, you know, they really talked about getting a, a single message out there. Uh, Sydney, um, you can see here that, um, that their costs were uh, substantially less than some of the others that we've been looking at, uh, about 27,000. And, um, and they followed the concept of a sign in uh, Japan that was actually developed in 1833. Um, and so that's basically how they determined their sign. And, and, um, um, and then they, you can see that they used the um, by the sea, which uh, came from a threat of, of tsunamis and that sort of thing. Uh, Colwood, Colwood I find kind of interesting because they have this nice new sign. Um, and, um, but then when you go a little further, they've got a, one that's completely different uh, down at the waterfront. So they're using two different um, signage um, sort of themes, which um, doesn't really make a lot of sense to me, but uh, both are nice, uh, but they, they don't seem to match, uh, at least in my opinion. Uh, Euclid, we didn't get much information on that, as you can see by the blank side there. It's not hard to read. Um, this sign here is um, one that um, you have to look at very seriously, Hue. Um, it's absolutely beautiful, very, very well constructed. It's uh, very visible. And the cost there um, is surprising. And I actually ran into Heather again yesterday and um, we, we discussed this, this, uh, this price and um, she said, it's accurate. That's what, uh, what they paid is about $13,000, um, which is rather incredible for, uh, for that particular sign. And I believe it was done um, um, by a company um, headquartered back East, but they have a Victoria branch. So um, it's one that really is, is impactful. Uh, Lake Cowichan, another nice, beautiful sign. It costs about $60,000. ICBC contributed to it. Uh, you can see there that they, um, they've got the bears as part of it. Um, and back several slides when we, were, when we uh, did our application in 2016, it was all part of the Bear Smart program. Um, and Lake Couch and like ourselves are, are very focused on their bear, on their bear community. So that sign has um, received a lot of favorable um, response. It's beautiful. Uh, and some of the rest of the ones here, I don't have uh, much information on. It was really hard to get, but I, you know, just showing you some pictures of some of them. Uh, Oak Bay, uh, Campbell River, uh, same thing. Not, we couldn't get the information on it. We tried. Um, Port Hardy, I think that sign's been there for decades, probably. Um, <clears throat> Esquimalt, same thing, kind of an older, smaller sign. <clears throat> uh, Langford, little is known about it. Souk. <clears throat> and just some conclusions. So um, my initial understanding was that there was a budget of about 150,000. I could be wrong there. Um, but if that is the case, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, certainly opportunity for a very high quality sign if the city chose to do that, or alternatively, um, maybe lower quality, uh, but look at our, our three primary entrances, um, uh, which might be something of consideration, um, you know, because we do have uh, three primary entrances. So if that budget were still available, I think the city could easily um, do something like that. Um, and really the, Again, back on the location, you know, the Terrace comments, the Duncan comments, uh, my own um, um, current observations, um, I think the city boundary makes a lot of sense. Um, and welcome signs are really important for community branding. And certainly when we reopen our communities after COVID, um, you know, I think, I think if we can have a signage, uh, it really uh, will help us. Um, similar signs, or sorry, simpler signs such as Nanus and Huayat um, seem to be really effective and um, both from a performance point of view and a cost effective point of view. Uh, the large projects like Revelstoke are really interesting, but I think they're, we're, we're not there. And um, um, yeah, so that's pretty much what, uh, what we've come up with. I'll field any questions if you like.
Thank you very much for that, Bill. Um, that was very helpful to see. So really appreciate the time that you put into this. Um, Council, are there questions? Councillor Paulson. Just an observation and uh, looking through the um, examples that Bill had up and everything, it, it seems like there's a trend now to uh, simpler signage. Obviously it's drive by, so you need to be able to read it pretty quickly. And like I say, the Hawaiian sign and then the new space sign, both of which I love their designs. Why can't we steal those? Um, makes sense to me where you're driving by, you know, all of a sudden you're in that community and uh, it makes sense that it's quick and easy to read. It's funny you suggest stealing it, uh, Councillor Paulson, because when I was in Anakala a few months ago um, in Hawaiian territory visiting Chief Robert Dennis, he, he was driving me around giving me a tour of the community and I saw the sign and I asked him to pull over so I could take a picture of it. And then I went on and on about how much I wanted a sign for Port Alberni and how I really wanted something exactly like that. And maybe we could just swap out Huayat and put Port Alberni in. And he seemed fine with it. So, <laughs> but, but that really is a sign that um, for me, especially um, I, I did learn what the budget of that sign was shortly after. And for me, that is a sign that um, it stands out. It is beautiful. It's, it's very much in line with the style that I've been thinking personally. Um, while the Parksville sign and some of the other more extravagant signs um, are beautiful and I would love to have them in our community, I, I've been envisioning something that is clear and classy looking and you know probably would be stent, um, and in, in the budget of 15 to thirty thousand dollars for a sign and maybe something that we could build off of. Um, for a, a larger directional signage project um, as we as we go and, and keep adding on wayfinding. So um, so I'm very glad you included that one in there, Bill. <laughs> hey, we could get all three signs done for an affordable um, budget as well. Absolutely. Councillor Haggard and then Councillor Solda. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I really appreciated seeing all the different signs, Bill, and then the new space sign and the way it sign are two of my top two as well, because uh, I like simplicity. But seeing this uh, presentation just reinforced that we need to do a, an entire um, sign strategy for our community. Putting up a welcome to Port Alberni sign is great, you know, if you do it at three entrances, but we need to carry forward that same thing that we decide that we choose throughout the community for wayfinding signs. So I hope we don't lose sight of that. We probably can't do it all at once, but if we can do our three uh, welcome signs and then implement wayfinding signs, you know, over the next five years, I think would be fantastic. It would really make a huge difference in our community. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you for that. Councillor Solda. Uh, yes, Madam Mayor, I would agree with everybody else that has spoken, um, simpler the better. And um, the UA at sign is a, it's, it's gorgeous. Uh, I like the cost. I'm assuming it would be a little more now, but um, maybe doing three signs, we could get a deal. I'm always into deals. The, the, the thing I have is um, where, and that's something we have to discuss. There's always been discussions regarding if it's further down by Walmart, but what about the other side? How do we get to the other side, right? And we, when the last sign study was done on my days was, um, do we put the, we need to make it more center so they know that there's an, another area of our community and uptown like the Third Avenue business area. So that was a really a lot of discussion and it's something that we would need to have if whatever we decide, just thank you. Thank you, Councillor Poon. Thank you. Um, I totally agree with all the sentiments uh, expressed so far. And you know, I feel that signage is very important, very important to our economic recovery. And, you know, if people don't know where we are, then, you know, it's, it's very hard for people to come and visit. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Washington, any comments? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, agreeing with everybody else, the way it's signed is awesome. And in East Bay, I see it every time we travel. Um, 
I was just wondering, Mr. Collette said we had a budget of 150,000. Is that true? We don't anymore. So that was one of the things that we pulled out of our budget, um, you know, responding to COVID for this year. So currently in our budget, we have $25,000. Um, which council, which is coming from a reserve, which council um, had talked about using to do planning and design work. Um, we could use it for planning and design work. We could go out and just ask for, you know, I don't know if it would be asking for, for bids or, you know, suggestions from, say, the company that did um, Nanus and the company that did um, Huayid and just see what we get back for rough pricing and design work. Yeah, I, I like I like the like either the new news bay or the way and I'd, I'd like to see three. So yeah, um, I think our big our biggest idea is location, location, location. For sure, and the ones that I had starred um, here that really stood out to me as kind of the the style or theme that um, <laughs> roughly I had been envisioning um, was of course Parksville. Everybody loves the Parksville sign. Not something that big and extravagant, but um, I'm surprised it was only $127,000 for um, how well known it is. So um, I think it's very well designed, even if it's larger than what we're looking for. Um, so Parksville, Huayat, Nanus, and the terrace sign really stood out to me as well. Um, just very beautiful sign. Um, and I don't think that one had a budget. But um, I think certainly, you know, those are also Huayat's 13,000. Um, Nanus around 30,000, Sydney around 27,000. I think there's definitely potential to get a sign in that range. Um, and I agree, I would like to, and we can ask our CAO for, you know, comment on process, but I would really like to get us, or like to have us get um, pricing or, or, you know, a rough concept idea from maybe two or three different contractors. Um, Councillor Corbeil, did you have any comment? Uh, the only comment I would have is uh, I'm wondering, Bill, if you in your research uh, came upon what happened to the uh, Welcome to Port Alberni sign uh, going into South Port Alberni. There's still a stylized salmon in the uh, flower bed, but the Welcome to Port Alberni is no longer there. And I suspect that wouldn't be a bad place to put a one of the three signs. Um, I'm sorry, I don't. I, I I don't know what's happened to that, um, Councillor Corbeil. Um, I can I can see if I can find out, but I'm not familiar with it. I guess my comment on the locate the location's great, uh, but at that point you're well within the city. Um, so you know, I guess my own perspective uh, doing the research is that the um, at the entrance of the city it really makes the makes logical sense or it seems to make logical sense people know they're here now um, and again we have we have three i guess you could say almost four entrances if you count coming from banfield um, and and then people oh okay i'm in port alberni now now where do i go right and that's where the secondary signage comes in the one along victoria key there is um, you're in just a beautiful area so it's almost a different concept I think but that's just my opinion and and or my thoughts on it initially absolutely and and my thoughts really are that um my original thought is that we start with um one welcome sign um and and I my personal preference because it's the most used sign into our community or most used location way into our community would be at Walmart um and, and then that we get a design that is easy to expand to wayfinding. And over the next year or so, we start to develop a strategy around where we want to see directional signage placed. Um, and then, you know, we make it a project where we're adding to our signage strategy every year and we're adding wayfinding signage every year. And maybe that's another welcome sign at a different location of town. Um, but I would personally like to start with something um, and then have it something that is easy to expand from. Councillor Solda. Madam Mayor, um, would we, you know, like when we do a design and we have an idea, it could be A, B and C, right? Could we get community input, like put it on our website? Hey, what do you think, A, B and C? Just to have the community's response. 
we know what our response probably would be, but I'd like to hear from the community too. And we do have some money put away, well, we'll be putting away, that we could start some kind of design concept and do some inquiries and stuff like that. It's not like we can't start now and then wait for the next budget year. Thank you. Absolutely. Or we can just try to get a sign for $25,000. Um, and rather than spending it on planning, um, we could try to spend that $25,000 on a sign. Um, but I, I liked your, your idea of um, adding it to like maybe using our Let's Connect platform. And once we have a few design concepts, um, putting it up there to get feedback before we make a final decision. And I do agree with you. I'd rather spend the money on something tangible than a study. Yeah, for sure. Councillor Paulson. Um, just how many people know that there is a Welcome to Port Alberni sign at Walmart now? And it's probably a really great example of probably not what to do. <laughs> but it's a blue sign. And um, actually, I noticed it for the first time just last week. And you actually have to turn the corner going into Walmart to actually see it. But uh, yeah. there. <laughs> anyway. I think that's one of the um, most rider friendly um, communities that was that, yeah. the contest that we won a few years ago. So that one is maybe two or three years old. Um, and yeah, it doesn't stand out. And we do certainly have, um, you know, a signage clutter sign or problem. And we have a lot of signage and no clear signage. So um, I think that a part of our strategy should be, um, you know, taking down some of the signs, not all, or maybe re relocating um, so that we are more intentional about where our signs are and, um, and where we're directing people. And yeah, so I think a bit more intentional. <laughs> um, CAO, do you have um, feedback at this point? Madam Mayor, um, yeah, I, there's a report um, in your agenda package on this uh, topic, and uh, this has been a really good discussion, and um, Council's um, already, I, I can see where your vision is um, is coming together around a couple of um, signs that you're most, att most attracted to. Um, so in my report, um, I've, I've recommended, uh, or I've asked the Council receive uh, my report and, and Mr. Collette's presentation, and that you um, consider giving some general direction. So um, we could put money in the budget uh, intentionally to, to build this. We have $25,000 that was intended to um, really to leverage a grant. And we thought that if we got this project shovel ready, we could um, look for some grant funding to help us achieve it this year. And in the absence of that, we could budget for the build in 2021. Um, it's not to say the council can't make a a revision to the budget later in 2020 if you if you see that um, you if you have a design you like and a budget you like and we have money in our strategic um, contingency fund so we i guess what i'm saying is we can get it built this year or we can get it built next year depending on a couple of variables i would suggest that the next good step would be for council to give staff direction to come back with two or three design concepts and um, you've already told us the signs that you you like and and so we would start looking at signs like that using the same kind of building materials similar designs to that and um and then council could decide if there were two or three sample designs council could decide if you want to make a choice on which sign to build or whether you want to um, undertake a public engagement process i think that um i'm concerned about spending the $25,000 that we have on design and planning um, when it looks like several communities have gotten their signs done for around $30,000 or less. So it seems to me like we have the money in our budget to do a sign and I'm hesitant to, um, to spend it on planning. So what would it look like if council wanted to proceed with getting designs or concepts? Like, would we go out to um, an RFP or would we just reach out to three different companies and say, can you give us a, you know, based on these signs, can you give us a, a rough estimate and a couple designs or concepts of, of what you would propose for a sign? 
Yeah, I think at this point we wouldn't RFP anything. We would reach out to one or more designers or uh, fabricators. And, uh, you know, if there are people, especially in the community, who work um, with the kinds of components that we're looking at, and Mr. Collette has also pointed out um, the names of a couple um, fabricators. So we can start there by saying, hey, we looked at some of your work you've done before. Can you give us a price quote on something that looks like this? And uh, maybe a, a little bit of a, a sketch, not a full on um, engineer yeah. drawing, but a sketch. Okay. I think personally, that's how I would like to see us proceed. I don't want to um, go through you know, a process that would cost us a lot of money planning for signs that we could spend on actually doing a sign. So I'd like to really try to stay to um, the budget of what the signs that you know we've seen that we like have come in at or around. Um, you know, I know that there's always factors that you know can drive a cost up or down, but I think that I see enough examples here of signs that have been done for around thirty thousand um, dollars that I would like to try to use the twenty five thousand that we have to actually get a sign. Um, Council. Councillor Solda. Yeah, Madam Mayor, there's a lot of talented graphic designers in Port Alberni who would probably volunteer some kind of design and that which would not cost us anything. It might be something to look into too. I agree with you. Let's get a sign for that instead of putting out money. But there's a lot of talented people here in this community. Thank you, Councillor Haggard. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I support your uh, intent that we should just go ahead and try and get a good concept and hopefully get at least one sign right away this year. But I hope further to that though that we do start looking at having a community-wide signing strategy instead of just having one also all over town. Thank you. Yes, I couldn't agree more. Councillor Washington. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I agree with your idea. I'd, I'd hate to see the money get wasted on, uh, as our Study. friend uh, Jack McClellan used to say, on the consultants. So uh, I think we've got a pretty good idea of what we want to do. So uh, let's let's get the money uh, let's let's get the money on the sign rather than uh, on the uh, RFPs and stuff. That uh, I, I think we're I think we're ready. Thank you, Councillor Poon. <clears throat> Yeah, I also agree that we should uh, spend the 25000 on the sign. And, you know, we, we've done a lot of studies over the years and studies are, well, they just end up on the shelves most of the time. So why don't we uh, spend it on a sign instead? Thank you. Thank you very much. Council, I'm going to move that we direct staff to bring back two to three concepts and, po and projected budgets for a sign project. Based on, I'll, I'll add to that um, based on the feedback from um, Bill Collette's presentation. Second, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Any further discussion? Okay, seeing none, all in favor. Any opposed? None opposed? Carried. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Bill, for the work you put into that. Um, mm -hmm. Excellent report and um, really appreciate. I think we're all excited just to... Um, hopefully see some progress on this initiative. Great, well, I echo your excitement. So thanks very much for including us. Thank you. Okay, council, that was our only delegation for today. And we have no unfinished business. So moving on to staff reports, item one is accounts, Councilor Washington. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I move that the certification of the Director of Finance dated April 27, 2020 be received and checks numbered 146050 to 146115 inclusive and payments of accounts totaling $785,357.69 be approved. Second, Madam Mayor. Thank you, all in favor. Carried. And item two is a report from the RCMP department. Let's see. Yes, good afternoon, Madam Mayor. Can you hear Hi me okay? There. I was just I was going to see if you were on. Wonderful. Welcome. Thank you. I uh, appreciate you having me here again today. I uh, apologize I'm not available by Zoom, but uh, we're working on that and I anticipate if we're still under COVID uh, conditions for the next uh, report that we'll have this in hand. 
So um, just to touch on my report from the first quarter of uh, 2020, excuse me a moment, shut my radio down here. Um, this report represents the policing activities undertaken by Port Alberni RCMP detachment during the first quarter of 2020, uh, January to the inclusion of all of March. And comparator statistics from the previous four months, uh, four years are attached at the end of the document. Um, in this uh, time frame, our officers received and responded to 3,037 calls for service. 2,667 of these calls occurred within the city of Port Alberni. The number of criminal offenses in this time frame are up 24% for the quarter compared to 2019. The possession of stolen property statistics are up significantly for the period. Um, partly due to two uh, significant projects uh, led by our crime reduction unit, resulting in multiple charges and the, de the detention of two prolific offenders early this quarter. So our optimism is that uh, this will uh, dem be demonstrated in the following quarters with uh, some reduction of numbers. The general duty watches and the crime reduction unit have been diligent in curfew checks and breach charges for bail conditions to keep people that are on bail in our community on conditions uh, abiding by the law to the greatest extent possible. Property crime is up 30% for the quarter compared to 2019. Um, on review, and I see uh, on my comments that I carried over from the last quarter, uh, I commented that this was uh, due to a statistic, statistical reporting change that uh, had occurred uh, in 2019. However, um, I've since reviewed that and uh, apparently that is not uh, relevant to the 30% increase. Um, there are some questions about uh, whether we're having better engagement from the community and that uh, there are, we are maybe getting more reports of incidents that are, are occurring uh, than we had in 2019, but that's a difficult uh, commodity to gauge. Being the start of the new uh, federal fiscal year, uh, Port Alberni was required to uh, put forward a new 2020 to 2021 annual performance plan. The priorities of our APP going forward will remain much as they were last year. Uh, the priorities are on broad headings, uh, traffic road safety, family violence, crime reduction, uh, property crimes and drugs specifically, Aboriginal policing and youth. As things stand at the moment, our, uh, the uh, selected uh, officer in charge for Port Alberni has not uh, been able to uh, move to our community as yet. I've spoken with him as of last week. He is getting some activity at his house, so we're optimistic that perhaps it can be uh, sold soon and be on his way here. Uh, he is uh, making plans that if this doesn't happen uh, quickly, that he intends to uh, resume to start his duties here in June of this year and that uh, could be sub subject to some uh, variations. The uh, operations officer is uh, still off on medical and his duties are being covered uh, by Sergeant Clive Seabrook. And for those of you who are unaware, uh, Sergeant Seabrook also has a transfer in hand. However, he has a house to sell as well. So it might be a little um, uh, self-serving on my part, but I hope to keep Clive around for quite some time. I echo that. <laughs> um, we're uh, doing well on the uh, aspect of uh, staffing uh, our watches. We have two uh, new recruits uh, in the detachment right at the moment that are uh, training. One is the uh, new provincial resource that was awarded to us last year. So we have some uh, logistics to sort out about that. Um, mostly it's a paperwork matter, but he's uh, on site and working and another one started in April. We have a new member, a member new to us with four years of service transferred in from Alberta and he's starting with us at the first of the next month. And uh, I put in a request for staffing for another constable position to be filled. Our numbers are looking uh, pretty good on the watches at the moment, uh, but uh, that's partly due to the uh, COVID concerns as we don't have people going on holidays and all of our training is uh, suspended at this point until September as well. Um, 
I, uh, I trust that uh, everybody that uh, is present has a copy of the report that uh, we've put forward with the uh, statistical uh, pages from the uh, preceding four years. And uh, that's the content of my report. And perhaps there are some questions. Thank you. Thank you so much for that report. Um, Councillor Paulson. I don't really have a comment on the report itself, but um, I just want to make a comment about our first responders of which the RCMP is a critical piece in light of what's going on in Nova Scotia. I just want to acknowledge the work that, that the RCMP department does. Thank you for your report. Uh, when other people are running away, our first responders are the ones that are running to the problem. And, and I can't thank you enough for your service and also in recognition of um, your counterparts in Nova Scotia. I just want to say thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for that, Councillor Paulson. Yes, thank you. Councillor Corbeil. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Peter, I think you touched on it, but uh, I just would like you to elaborate a little bit more. The, uh, the increase in theft from vehicle is uh, triple what it was a year ago. Now, is that was that due to the reporting structure or, or is there some other issues that you could touch on? That's a difficult uh, question to answer. Um, Primarily, uh, we're still having the same issue that uh, was here when I arrived about this time last year, is that uh, people are not securing their vehicles. So we're we're continuing to get uh, thefts from vehicles, but uh, I could probably count on one hand the number of times uh, we get a report of a vehicle being broken into for a theft. So what is continuing to happen is that people are leaving valuables in their vehicles, they're leaving them un unlocked, and uh, once their possessions have left, we're getting a call about it. And we investigate these uh, as much as uh, uh, priority calls permit and uh, the uh, evidence on the scene uh, can afford to us. We have our forensic ident uh, section attend if, if it's practical, practical to uh, do a scene examination and uh, progress our uh, investigations from there. But the uh, biggest problem of late is still uh, that people are leaving unsecured vehicles. In, to that regard, um, and I'm I apologize for stealing the thunder of uh, Galen Thurgood on this, but uh, uh, Dave Cousin has started with our uh, volunteer as our volunteer manager, manage, manager and he's uh, done an excellent job to date in keeping himself very busy and applying himself wherever he can to uh, assist the detachment in the city. But he's uh, already advertising a lock it or lose it campaign on our Facebook page that's uh, getting a lot of activity, and uh, we're hoping that that particular statistic can. Uh, start coming down if people start securing their valuables. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Councillor Solda. Yeah, a question for Peter regarding the um, property crimes, because we hear a lot about property through the internet, just through people. If the stats say 499, is that also the same thing, um, just the reporting? from past or is it happening now? I'd like to see what April is going to bring in in the next couple of months too. Yes, I. Uh, this is from uh, January to the end of March. So I can't speak to whether this trend is continuing or declining. Okay, so out there, it, um, drugs are harder to get and the cost has gone up. So it says, would this be part of it too, you think, for the property crime? It costs more for the drugs, and and um, a lot of owners are now going through having cameras put up in their houses and that. So some are feeling, is it worthwhile to have the cameras? What does the RCMP do with the film part of it? Like, is does is it effective in in your area for owners, property owners, to have cameras? Uh, it can be very effective. Uh, we're constantly uh, attending calls whether they're at residences or businesses where uh, the suspects are captured on video and uh, the uh, general duty members are very uh, aware of uh, the people that are coming to our attention on a regular basis and uh, we're very quickly distributing the images through the detachment uh, first uh, so that we have it in a, a secure closed environment and we're frequently identifying exactly uh, 
who the perpetrators are. So you know, the cameras can be very helpful. However, prevention is uh, always better than uh, trying to band-aid after the fact. So uh, target hardening, um, locking things up, uh, having good illumination, having good lines of sights uh, to your uh, property, allow your neighbors to be part of your security system. So these are the things that we would uh, encourage people to do. Watch out for your neighbors and report suspicious activity. Thank you. Super. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions from Council? Councillor Haggard. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, just a comment and then a question as well. I had someone complaining to me about we need more RCMP on the streets. You know, crime has gone crazy, uh, you know, so all that sort of thing. Then he proceeded to tell me how there is a place where people sell stolen property and his wife went down there and bought a microwave knowing that it was stolen. So I think we have to be part of the solution here. <laughs> and my I question, agree. <laughs> we can't help cr criminals. And um, I believe um, that you were at the um, seminar on crime and businesses that the Chamber of Commerce put on, if I remember correctly. Has there been any other additional feedback uh, from businesses on what they can do to help for criminals and um, shoplifting that is happening in our community. And what concerns me is that it's really been on the rise. And most of the people who work in retail and service industry are females. So I feel they're kind of more at risk, uh, you know, for if things get a little out of hand, if they're confronted. So what are your thoughts? Or do you have any comments on what we can do to help businesses? Thank you for that question. Um, what, as a result of that uh, meeting in February, um, we've had some. I've had some personal contact with a couple of the business owners that are staffed almost exclusively with female employees, and uh, what uh, I said to them is uh, being echoed by the watch commanders and uh, supported by the watches in our crime reduction units, is that if uh, businesses have uh, an offender that's coming in there or somebody that they don't want in their business because. Uh, uh, they're uh, threatening their staff uh, either by uh, uh, explicitly or uh, indirectly and uh, they come in, they go out and uh, aren't purchasing but they're finding uh, the property is missing. Uh, we have no uh, problem to uh, be present when that person's there to uh, support the, uh, um, the business to tell the people that they're not welcome there and uh, not to return. And that's happened on a couple of occasions since February. Great, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from Council? Councillor Washington. <laughs> there it goes. Sorry. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, just a question. Uh, uh, Peter mentioned the store owners. Um, do this, as a store, store owner, do you have the right, say, if Joe Lunchbucket comes in and you know he's going to cause trouble or you're, you're sure he's maybe uh, done some shoplifting. Can you refuse um, Joe from coming into your store? Is that, are, the, are the merchants able to do that? That is completely within their authority. You have the right to refuse service to anyone. Perfect. Um, you know, if uh, they feel that that's uh, discriminatory or their civil rights or their uh, human rights have been abridged, they can take their complaint uh, to those tribunals and uh, have their day. But um, it's, a, it's a difficult situation for uh, retailers uh, and service providers in that uh, although they uh, provide services to the public, they also have an obligation to provide a safe and harassment-free uh, workplace for their employees. So uh, it's a balancing act. And, uh, you know, my officers will be out uh, to assist that and to keep the peace uh, in situations like that. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, seeing no more questions. Um, thank you so much, Sergeant Dion, for coming on today. Council, would somebody like to move receipt of the report? I'll move, Madam. So Mayor. Moved. Second. Thank you. All in favor? Carried. Okay, thank you so much. Moving on to item three which is from the Director of Parks, Recreation and Heritage, an informational report on hosting the BC Games in 2024 or 2028. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Mayor. 
So on February 24th, 2020, Council directed staff to prepare a report that speaks to the feasibility of the city hosting either the BC Winter or Summer Games in 2024 or 2026. Uh, developments since February 24th include on April the 2nd, the BC Games Society shifted the bid submission deadline from September 18th to February 19th of 2021. And the 2020 BC Summer Games scheduled in Maple Ridge have been rescheduled to the summer of 2024. And on June 10th, uh, staff are planning on attending a conference call to discuss the bid process for the 2024 BC Winter Games and the 2026 BC Summer and Winter Games. Uh, staff recommends that Council consider two options, the first being that Council for the City of Port Alberni encourage staff to attend the June 10th conference call to obtain further information regarding hosting BC Games, or secondly, that Council direct staff not to proceed with exploring hosting BC Games at this time. Unmute myself. Are there, thank you very much, are there questions from Council? Councillor Haggard. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I would strongly encourage staff to attend this. It doesn't cost anything to attend and get the information and bring it back to council. I personally am very supportive of exploring this idea. I know it's a lot of work, but I really feel that our community, we need a lift. And you know, we've had some struggles over the last while uh, as in many communities, but I feel that we've struggled maybe more than most. And I think it'd be a really great way to showcase our community again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Paulson. Um, I just want to say, um, I think it's, it would be really beneficial if we had staff attend that, that meeting. And um, uh, the thing about BC Games is it's kind of a turnkey operation. It's not like you're inventing the wheel, but you're only as good as your volunteer base or your volunteers and or the leader that will step forward and, and drive the project. Um, so those are some of the things that you need to build. If you make the decision that you're going to go on it, you better have a leader in mind and a leader should be prepared to build an infrastructure underneath it. And um, I personally um, would volunteer to help out, um, but I would not volunteer to be chair again for anything. So um, I was um, just going to say, I nominate Councillor Polson. I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> I'm a little worn out after U17, but um, uh, you know these things highlight your communities. It's a chance for us to show off. Um, it is expensive to put these on, but Port Alberni has done such a good job in the past that I believe that the um, that the BC Games and I know that U17 we actually had a um, a heritage fund left over afterwards to distribute in the community. So. Um, if it's done right and, and the right people are working on it, um, you can actually have a, a, a heritage program left over. So um, I'm in favor. I, 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 I think it's great that we can show off our community. Absolutely. Councillor Solda. Um, Madam Mayor, nobody says, I agree that staff should go and um, have a discussion but nobody is saying yes or no that we're going to have it. It's just to find out more information and see what it's all about. So just because it, I don't want people to get the idea that, oh, we're going to go for it until we know more about it. Thank you. I think I missed Councillor Washington. <laughs> it's my own fault for not saying stuff, eh? Um, <laughs> I, I agree we should send somebody. Uh, I, I think probably the criteria has changed since the last games we hosted. Uh, my my knee jerk reaction was we've got no more volunteers left in this community. But uh, agreeing with all the past uh, comments, I think this might be a kick in the pants that we need to become that community with the heart again and get on the media with some good news stories instead of uh, the stuff that they've been shooting about Port Alberni. But uh, yeah, for sure, if we go go get the information and uh, we'll see where we go from there. Yeah, I agree completely, Councillor Washington. I think um, that this is a great opportunity and it is a ways out still. Um, and, you know, these kinds of events really build community pride and um, volunteers are always, um, you know, are always are getting more and more and more difficult to find. Um, but I think this is a great opportunity for us to um, reinvigorate and, and hopefully find a new volunteer core. Um, or build off of a new volunteer core that I think we're finding right now through COVID. 
as our kind of more common volunteers, our retirees um, are more vulnerable and more at risk and are not able to contribute time um, as much as they typically do or in the same ways. I've seen a new demographic of volunteers coming out of, of people more in my generation. And I think that's been really great to see. So hopefully we could continue to leverage that change. Um, Councillor Poon. Well, I agree with everything that's been said. It's a really exciting opportunity for us. Uh, so I would like to make the motion. Uh, I'll move the Council for City of Port Alberni receive the report from Director of Parks, Recreation and Heritage dated April 15, 2020, providing information about hosting future BC Games. And further that uh, we send a staff member to collect more information. Thank you. Is there a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Haggard. Any further comments? Seeing none, all in favour? Carried. Thank you very much. Moving on to item four from the Director of Parks, Recreation and Heritage again, a report dated April 20th, um, speaking to the carved sign or um, as it is named, the focal point sign. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, yes, the city owns a carved sign as uh, Mr. Collette mentioned during his delegation earlier uh, at this meeting, referred to it as the focal point sign. And uh, it has been, it was located at the Chamber of Commerce Vis Visitor Center until 2011. And staff recommends council consider one of two options. First, that council for the city of Port Alberni direct staff to explore installing the sign at a location of council's choosing or seek public input into the matter of location or consider uh, taking no action at this time with this particular sign. Thank you very much. Councillor Solda. Madam Mayor, I remember when Kim Schroeder designed this sign and um, I, I would like to see it go back up. A lot of the public would like to go see it go back up. So I'm just gonna make the motion that Council for the City of Port Alberni direct staff to explore installing the sign at a location uh and seek input from the public on the location thank you and i will second that um and and i will just add that i i really appreciate the comment earlier by bill collette that um this is not really a sign it is a, a piece of art um and i agree really strongly with that um it's never really to me been um been a sign it doesn't really welcome you to port alberni um, but it is a beautiful piece of art that we should be very proud of. And I'm not sure what the right location is, but I would love to see it um, reinstalled in our community in some way. I know at one point we had talked about putting it at Millstone Park. Um, maybe that's the right location, maybe not, but um, I'd definitely like to see this um, up in our community again. Councillor Washington. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, when we talk this, the focal focal point sign, sorry, we're just talking the main, we're not talking um, where they had the local businesses or advertisers on the sides. We just want that main, we're talking just that main carved, like you say, that piece of art. I think so. Okay, so we've got a picture of it here. Yeah. So I think you're right, Councillor Washington, um, kind of what's shown there, not with the advertising. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Haggard. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I agree totally. It is a beautiful piece of art and it deserves to be displayed. And it should be something where tourists and locals alike can get out, have a look at, get their pictures taken by it. Uh, I think it would be very much appreciated. And I believe if you remember from our first budget a couple budgets ago that Rob Cranevelt does have some um, preliminary drawings on doing this. So I'm not sure if uh, our director of parks and recreation has conferred with him or not, but I do believe he does have some drawings on how to display it and what to do with it. Uh, we have to be careful where we do put it though, because by Millstone Park, I think it might get weather too, too much. So we do have to be careful. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Did I miss anyone for comments? Okay. Councillor Paulson. Just very, very quickly. And I, I concur, it's a work, work of art and it was lost in just a drive by where it was located previously. It needs to be located where people can actually get out of their vehicles and enjoy the artwork. Um, but it might be an opportunity for us to locate it with 
something else in the community that where you kind of uh, have a, not necessarily a theme, but just more than one thing to stop your vehicle for. And um, so that's that's just site consideration. And uh, it's a beautiful piece of art. It, it's, it, it's a shame to have it uh, laying down at the works yard. Oh, the other thought was, is any time that we've talked about this sign, um, there's a sticker, a price tag sticker to put this thing back up, which to me seems to be um, quite onerous. And it might be an opportunity for us to look into granting or volunteerism or something like that to get the sign back up. Absolutely. It's expensive to put it up. Yes, so the report here says um, to attach to an existing concrete structure that is able to support the carving would be $10,000 or to construct a foundation roof or to stand freely would be about $40,000. So it is not cheap. Um, if we were to do the work to, um, you know, uh, it says, um, you know, to work to required to prior to reinstallation, a fresh coat of paint, $2,000, that's minimal. We could get the sign ready. We could do the planning work for, or public engagement on where we might wanna see this, select a location, and then we would have um, a shovel ready project that we could submit um, a grant application for. So I would love to see us do the work now so that um, when funds come available, we can find us, we can put this up. Councillor Haggard. Thank you, Madam Mayor. We might also want to consider uh, contacting our local service groups to see if maybe they could even do a joint project and, and get the sign put back up again. Thank you. Great idea. Absolutely. Councillor Solda. Actually, Councillor Hager spoke quite well about what I was going to say. Thanks. Excellent. Okay, so we have a motion on the floor to um, uh, that Council for the City of Port Alberni Direct, oh, okay, so to um, direct staff to um, explore installing this sign at a location um, and seek public input. And I would imagine that includes um, refinishing the sign for the $2,000. Um, uh, assuming we have $2,000 in the budget or time to make that happen. Um, it was moved and seconded. Councillor Solda. Just one more thing. If, if we, I thought it was all ready to go. Is, it, is there still stuff we have to do on the sign? Just to um the report re does say that um the report does say that it needs um a fresh coat of finish for two thousand okay so madam mayor it would be nice for staff to contact the artist too to get his input because he's the one that designed it and last time they coded it not necessarily the city coded it but other people did there was no input and i know the artist was quite upset about it and it would be nice because he does live in the community sure Absolutely. Okay, uh, Councillor Paulson. So just historically, since the sign came down, it was located to the works yard. The fellows down at the works yard have completely refurbished the sign. They have finished it once, but that was a few years ago. This is a sign that probably needs to be refinished every second year. And uh, it's probably just a maintenance coat that needs to go on there now. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, um, so on the motion, all in favor? None opposed, carried. Okay, so moving on to item five from the Director of Parks, Recreation and Heritage, we have the Alberni Aquarium and Stewardship Center leasable area. Thank you, Madam Mayor. On April 14th, Council directed staff to explore the feasibility of splitting the current Alberni Aquarium leasable area, thereby creating a second leasable space upstairs. Uh, staff can confirm that it is possible to split the current footprint into two separate spaces. Uh, so it's staff's recommendation that council consider two options. First, that the Alberta Aquarium Association continues to lease both stories of the current facility as the, at the current lease rate with no subletting permitted, or that the two stories or spaces are split. The Alberta Aquarium Association leases the ground floor with an $800 monthly reduction in rent, and the city undertake a process to determine best use and best tenant for the second floor. Thank you very much. Council, are there questions? Councillor Poon. Thank you. I think the option to allow the Alberni Aquarium Association to reduce their rent by 800 a month uh, seems like a good way to go because you're, we're helping them to uh, perhaps stay in business for a bit longer. And also uh, we're freeing up space that they don't need. 
Um, so I would be in favor of option two. Thank you. And I'll second that, Madam Mayor. That was not a motion. <laughs> so, <laughs> Councilor <Okay>. Corbeil. <laughs> well, I too agree with uh, splitting up the, uh, the area, but I, I'm a little bit confused on what time frame we're talking about. At the last meeting, uh, there was a three months, a six months, and three months uh, starting once the COVID uh, epidemic or pandemic is, has run its course. What, how many months are we talking about in regards to um, relaxing the, the rent? And I'm wondering if this uh, Canada Emergency Fund might come into play in all of this. Thank you. So currently in our draft budget, we have um, three months rent reduction in place. The original request was for six months, but council um, has only granted three months. Um, and I believe right now, if we make no changes, that would be starting April 1st. Um, although at the last meeting, we did talk about having that start, um, you know, post COVID and dealing with rent um, up until then, as we are for the other businesses at the Harbor Key. Um, now, will the rent reduction help? Possibly. Um, I think it's important for us to remember that the rent reduction, um, the, first of all, the, the um, program details are not out yet. So, you know, we've heard it talked about, but there's not actual full details on qualifying for that yet. But what is out is that you have to have a 70% percent reduction in revenues. So um, they may have that um, from fundraising or, you know, but they, uh, they might not. Um, a lot of businesses who were hoping to get that rent reduction are now realizing that they won't because maybe they've had a 60% rent reduction. Um, so instead of getting, you know, a little bit, you get nothing. So um, I think that's a bit unclear still. Councillor Paulson. Just um, uh, di direct, well, uh, it, could you, are we restricted into what kind of uh, business or tenant we can have there? And uh, potentially will we be looking at, so we can expand the, um, the choices of tenants. Uh, will we have to make changes to um, the Harbor Key um, rental platform as far as who or what can go into a rental space in it. The only thing that I think about that space, if we separate it out, it's, it's kind of, a, it would become a unique uh, space. That's really not a retail type space or anything like that. It's more an admin type space, but just thoughts on what kind of tenant we might be able to have. Thank you. Do you have a director of parks, recreation, and heritage comment? I'll defer to CAO Ply here. If he's got any more insight on zoning. Madam Mayor, Council, I, I don't have the zoning. Uh, we haven't looked into the zoning at this point in time, but I believe the report uh, references that um, if we split the spaces, we will um, examine the zoning, see what activities are permitted there, and then Council can make a decision around the, the best permissible use, and then we could go out to an RFP or some, some other process to seek the tenant that best suits the city's needs. So um, it'll, it'll be a matter of zoning. Thank you. No, that's that's all I need to know, and we don't need an answer today. Thank you. Other questions from Council? Councillor Poon. Thank you. Uh, I'm just interested to know, in terms of splitting the space, uh, what would the rough cost be? Thank you. So, Madam Mayor, further to CAO's a CAO applies mention of zoning. So. We haven't uh, obtained specific costing yet at this stage. We know that it would be uh, relatively minimal in that looking to uh, close in an existing interior door. So removing interior door hardware, um, retrofitting with the, a new frame and some potential um, drywall, that sort of thing. So I don't expect it to be exorbitant, but until we receive uh, firm direction from council, staff have not uh, exhausted all of the costs at this stage. Thank you. Other questions from council? 
Okay, seeing none. Um, CAO, I'm wondering um, what would our staff time, roughly staff time commitment be to go through the process of, um, you know, not splitting, not the physical work, but um, putting out an RFP, looking for a tenant. What if we don't find a tenant? Um, I'm, I'm just wondering if it is worth it to worth it for us to go through this process. Madam Mayor, um, if Council gives us this, gives us direction one way or the other here, unless you tell us otherwise, um, that it would it would seem that your direction is to enter into an lease with the Aquarium Association. So um, whether that's for both spaces or, or one, and you'll you'll give us direction shortly, I'm sure. Um, so our first step would be to engage um, into a new lease agreement with that association and hopefully be back in front of you quickly with a draft release, uh, lease for your consideration. After that lease is approved and signed, I think at that point we would turn our minds to, um, and maybe at the same meeting we would bring a report and say, here's the zoning, here's the potential uses that are permissible. Um, council, which, do you, which use do you want us to pursue there? Um, if you gave us that direction, then we could develop a quick RFP and get that out to the public. So in terms of staff time, I wouldn't see it as being onerous. Um, this wouldn't turn around in the first month or two or three. Um, it would take a bit of time to, to get done. I, I'll remind council that um, we, we investigated the ability to split these spaces um, because the Aquarium Association had indicated they intended or they hoped to sublease the, um, the upstairs space and uh, ask council's permission to do that. And council indicated you prefer not to have somebody subletting space that they've leased from the city. So um, that's why we looked at, it, at splitting them. If we don't split them, then you will need to put our minds to, um, do we allow the, cha the association to sublet or not? Okay. Councilor Haggard. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I think we should uh, look to investigate um, Leasing space uh, in Port Alberni, there is a real shortage of office space, believe it or not, and people do have difficulty finding um, sufficient office space that they can use for their particular type of business. Uh, so I think we should pursue that. It would be the most beautiful view of an office in Port Alberni because it is absolutely stunning up there and you're at Harbor Key, which is probably the pearl in our uh, community. So I think we can lease it out and get premium funds for it. Thank you. Thank you. Would you like to make a motion? <laughs> okay, firstly, I'd like to move that the report from the Director of Parks and Recreation and Heritage dated April 20th, 2020, providing information about the feasibility of separating the space leased by the Alberni Aquarium and Stewardship Center be received. Second, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Any further questions or comments? On receipt of the report, seeing none, all in favor? Carried. And secondly, I'd like to move that the two stories, uh, that the city undertake a process to determine best use and best tenant for the second floor of the space. Okay. Right. Would you like to add into that motion um, that we split the units and reduce the monthly rent of the aquarium oh, by $800? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Is there a seconder? Second, Madam Mayor. Wonderful. You. Okay, any further questions or comments on this? Seeing none, all in favor? Carried. Thank you. Okay. Moving on to item six from the Director of Finance, Municipal Solid Waste Volumes, um, COVID-19 Impacts. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So at the April 14th council meeting, the, uh, the question was asked whether we are seeing an increase in solid waste uh, being tipped at the landfill through our curbside collection. The closure of the Third Avenue Depot uh, may have led this to be considered, um, but at that time, uh, we still have the ability to, to uh, de deposit our recyclables at our curb. So the material going to the Third Avenue Depot from the city residents could include uh, glass, uh, polystyrene and flexible plastic, all other items can be left at the curb. So when I contacted the ACRD to investigate where we were midway through April, the, uh, the volume of waste that is being tipped through the curbside collection has actually decreased over prior two years. And 
the time frame of the the uh, the the the, the time frame that we're looking at is a very small time frame, so we'd still need to make sure that we review this as we move forward. But uh, most people that that continue to to recycle will continue to recycle under these uh, conditions and find alternative ways. And there's alternative ways that uh, the ASRD uh, has provided, and that includes going out to the landfill or the other options in 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 the uh, in the city limits. So, uh, based on past experience in in solid waste in in, in my prior role. Uh, people that do good will continue to do good. So, so here's hoping that they'll continue to do that. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Are there any questions? Councillor Washington. I'm just pleased with that report. Thank you very much. I, I sort of had this bad feeling that they wouldn't, it wouldn't make it to the recycle depot. It would make it more to uh, the green bin. So no, I'm quite proud of Port Alberta right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, would somebody like to move her seat? So moved. <laughs> okay, seconded by Councillor Solda. All in favor? Carried, thank you. Moving on to item seven from the Manager of Community Safety, Nuisance List Review. Hello, Madam Mayor, thank you. All right. Uh, the property at 3110 2nd Avenue was designated a nuisance uh, by council on November 27, 2017, based on above average calls for service. An owner of property that has been designated as a nuisance is permitted to request council's review after a period of 12 months of being on the nuisance list. The property owner is required to demonstrate that significant improvement to the property has occurred, including a substantial de decrease in call volume from nuisance calls received by the RCMP Fire Department's Building and Bylaw Services. Uh, this property is no longer considered to be a nuisance, and therefore no alternatives or options are provided. Okay. And we're just seeing the pictures up on our screen now. So, okay. Just so you're aware, there's a new owner uh, as of May 1st of last year and who has done all the improvements to the property. Thank you. Are there questions from Council? Councillor Poon. I'm just wondering why are the windows painted? Like the glass seems to be painted. It is. It, it was down below. Uh, he has taken most of it off. They plan on replacing the windows and doing improvements downstairs. The first bit of approved improvements were done upstairs to the suite, and he actually has current tenants in there uh, working in the community and one student. Nice. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Solda. Madam Mayor, I'm going to move that um, the motion that Council rescind the motion resolved at Council's regular meeting held November 27th. 2017 declaring the property located at 3110 2nd Avenue and legally described as lot 1 district lot 1 Alberni district plan VIP 6800 the property a nuisance property thereby removing the subject prop property from the city's nuisance property listing. Thank Second. you Mr. Seconder and any comments? Councillor Paulson? I just want to applaud the new owner on on the work that they've done and encourage them to um, keep the building, um, you know, in its. If we remove the nuisance um, a designation, to uh, keep it there. We've no, we have had instances where we've backtracked on nuisance properties, and then once we remove that designation, people have just gone back to their own ways. So, anyway, well done on that building and. Um, it's, it's uh, great to have an owner that has pride in their building. Yeah, thank you for that. And, and I would say um, I own a business next door, obviously, and I can certainly um, attest that this building is not a nuisance anymore. Um, and I really don't think this is a situation where we're going to see um, you know, this building slide back into being a nuisance. The property owner is there on a regular basis. Um, you know, he was very engaged in the renovations that were done. Um, and it's just great to see um, a building that, you know, was a problem in our community turn into um, a great place for people to live. So um, I'm very pleased with what's happened here for sure. Although I 
I don't personally like the color that it's been painted, but but it, it's a it's a big improvement still, <laughs> and it looks great otherwise. <laughs> it's better than the coat of many colors before. <laughs> That's right, absolutely. And I'm looking forward to seeing what else they do with it. I know that they're hoping to um, to move on to the main floor next, so um, it'll be great to see. Are there any further questions? Okay, seeing none on the motion, all in favor? Carried, thank you very much. On to item eight from the Manager of Community Safety as well, Enhanced Security Initiative Program. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. The uh, City of Port Alberni established its Enhanced Security Initiative Program in 2018 under its former manager. When the program was introduced, it provided incentives to commercial property owners to implement measures that would improve public safety and enhance protection and security of their buildings and surrounding properties. Following the departure of the former manager, the latter part of 2019, the program was inactive. Uh, since I'm now in the role, it, I'm propose, uh, the city is now proposing that this program be reinstated and expanded to include residential property uh, owners within the city boundaries. No alternatives or, or options are being provided at this time, as this report is being provided for council's information only. Thank you very much. Okay. And I see that it does have a $50,000 budget. Um, so 25,000 from 2018 and 25,000 from 20, or sorry, 2019 and 2020. And that's the only thing I wanted to confirm. Other questions? Councillor Solda. Oh, there you are. Um, Madam Mayor, just to confirm. So this is in the budget. It Once we pass this, people can apply. Is that correct? Am I understanding this right? Are you that there? Is, Hello? That is correct. Okay. okay, so I have do have a question from some of the public that have asked me if they have, would, would it go back retroactive if they've just put up their systems now, could they apply for the program? Although they might have purchased the gear a year ago or six months ago, but they just put it up. So could they apply for it? We would certainly look at that. We're looking at um, helping everybody equally. So Excellent. I think, that would be a good option. Okay, and I also have that um, from people that I know they had their cameras stolen. Like they were scouted out and the cameras were cut down and taken out for a walk. They went for a walk with the cameras. So could they apply for the program to put new cameras back up or? Definitely, are these people that have already applied before? One of the- I don't know. I would encourage anybody and everybody to apply uh, while we have the funding. And if, uh, last time we only had 23 business owners, so it, and we didn't max out our funding. So it'd be nice to max it out and get every, okay. give everybody an opportunity. And this is also residential too. Correct. If yeah. I'm reading that. Okay, super. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Poon. Thank you. I'm really glad to see this initiative. Uh, happening and also, you know, just based on the crime report that we heard earlier today, prevention is the best way to go, right? So I'm glad to see this. Thank you. Yes, um, as well, if those people who do get cameras, uh, we are going to take do a registration with them so that we can share that with the police if, in case there's a, a crime within the neighborhood. That's great. Thank you. Any other questions from council? Okay, seeing none. Um, thank you very much for the report. I'm excited to see this. Um, I've told people uh, for quite a few months that the second round of this funding was coming and that it was expanding to residential. So um, I'm really looking forward to seeing this program being released again because it was a success last time. Um, would somebody like to move receipt? So motion, motion to receive. Thank you. Moved by Councillor Poon, seconded by Councillor Solda. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. Moving on to item nine from the Director of Engineering and Public Works, we have a mutual aid agreement for water services. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, yeah, the report in front of you basically is asking that uh, we execute an agreement with the ACRD <laughs> entitled the Water Services Agreement. Um, this is a result of the Minister of Public Safety and his Solicitor General 
enacting a ministerial order, which requires local authorities to use best efforts to enter into mutual aid agreements with neighboring jurisdictions around first responder, wastewater and drinking water services. So this will cover um, our operators looking after or doing a few things on their water system if, if their operators go down due to COVID or, or any other um, type, of, type of issue and, and same for them. Thank you. Are there any questions? Okay. Seeing none, Councillor Washington, would you like to read the motion? Thank you, Madam Mayor. I move that the, the City Council authorize Mayor and the City Clerk to execute the agreement between the City of Port Alberni and the Alberni Clayquot Regional District entitled Water Services Agreement, effective May 1, 2020, and expiring December 31, 2025. Second, Madam Mayor. Seconded by Councillor Corbeil. Seeing no more comments, all in favor? Carried. Thank you very much. On to G bylaws. And the first one from the Director of Finance is the five year financial plan 2020 to 2024. All right. Bylaw number 5003. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So um, on April 14th, the uh, council provided uh, the second reading of the financial plan bylaw. At that time, there was no changes made. Uh, this uh, this pro process began in late fall and obviously with the COVID pandemic, uh, there's been some changes from the original direction on March 10th, uh, where we sat at a 4.3% uh, tax increase to the average single family resident. That now today is at 1.1%. Um, and that was in, that was due to some shifting of priorities and, and removing some items from the uh, from the tax implications. So as far as tax tax increases across the uh, Mid Island here, we are one of the lowest uh, in the Mid Island region. Um, just doing a scan, and, I, and I'd like to provide more information on that. But some are still working through their financial plan bylaw and, and adopting those. So. Until that's done, I won't give uh, final uh, numbers uh, as, as other councils are working through, but uh, at this time, we look like we are one of the lowest across the Mid-Island. You know, when it came to the commercial rent comment earlier, Madam Mayor, you, you, you said that these were just announced. Of course, I, I, I concur with that and we don't know the full details as far as the impact, but uh, just, just doing a, 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 a general look at what could be the impact on the financial plan for commercial properties that we have, it'll be under $10,000. And I think we can manage this within our COVID response uh, funding that we have. When it comes to the BC transit uh, costs that we see incurred, uh, uh, Councillor Solda is correct. The, the, the end date for the uh, month waiver was uh, on April 20th and that continues, but these are mandates from the province as far as uh, social distancing on on, on BC Transit. So these would have to remain in place. We could still have the, the uh, motion to waive fees moving forward. And we, we have this at about $28,000 per month. That being said, when I talked with BC Transit last week, making any changes to the contract has a 60 day uh, requirement with our operator. Uh, we need to make sure that we have uh, an idea of what we want to do as far as changes to the transit service. The transit service also uh, could make some minor changes uh, without having a large impact on, on the, uh, the service level, but any major uh, changes would have to go through a, a review and that could take up to two or three months. So at this time, uh, staff doesn't have any recommendation, but we are hopeful that we have senior levels of government support these transit services throughout the province and enable the local governments to provide the service to those who need it. And, and, and those include uh, our, 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 our essential workers and, and, and our vulnerable population. Uh, and, and, I and, I, and I can see that uh, uh, senior levels of government are looking at uh, TransLink and, and larger centers uh, to, to try to support them and still provide those essential services. And we're far down the, far down the road as far as uh, uh, level of service. And any level of service that we take out is so intermingled with the whole uh, the whole route that it would be very difficult for us to take out uh, any any level of service without having a large impact on 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 the service as far as uh, timing in between routes. So, 
BC Transit will work with us if, if Council gives the direction to make any changes, but at this time, I think uh, Council could lobby uh, senior levels of government to support the transit service to keep these services in place. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Um, I have Councillor Solda so far to speak. Go ahead, Councillor. So Thank you. So just to get it clear, obviously we need to go either say yay or nay to $28,000, but that, could we not get that back from the province at all? I know you were just speaking about the province, but, or through their emergency fund, they're the ones that called the state of emergency. Could that not be put through that? If not, then we have the $200,000 in this budget for recovery and that come out of that. We have talked about that in the past for the last run. So I'm just kind of curious on that. Yeah. So I'm not sure if the funding can go through uh, emergency management BC as far as uh, a response that would have to be explored. I, I believe that the the route that we would sh should be taking is to lobby senior levels of government and 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 I believe this is happening as we speak to support transit service across the province. I believe they're meeting on Thursday with the house so maybe that'll come up. So Madam Mayor do we need to make a motion to keep going forward on the transit regarding the $28,000? How do we work that? Well, right now like we're talking work? about um, possibly passing our financial plan. Um, I don't think that we need to make a motion on, um, we're not being asked to make a motion on transit today. Okay, fair enough. Councillor Corbeil. Uh, yeah, question uh, for Andrew. Have you given any thought to the implications if, in fact, the Harbour Key businesses uh, are uh, accepted into this new uh, commercial rent assistance program? I would assume then that uh, the city would lose 25% of the uh, rents owing. Uh, I don't even know how many different uh, buildings and, and storefronts there are down there, but I suspect it would be a, a sizable amount of money over the uh, course of the three months. Have you given any thought to that, Andrew? I think that was the $10,000 that was mentioned earlier, if I understood correctly. That is correct, Madam Mayor. Um, when, when we looked at the exposure, it would be 25% uh, of 25% of the year which is under $10,000. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Paulson, did you have a comment? Not until we uh, go through the, through the, um, the motions here. Just, I wanted to bring to attention the, um, the chart where we had the um, tax increases for the next five years and the implication of 1.1 this year and what it means in ensuing years, but um, we can deal with the motions first. Well, you're welcome to, we can definitely go through that now. And um, that's a piece of the financial plan. So sure. That is what we're I, I just wanted to, I know that the majority of the public is ecstatic that we're at 1.1%, but I want to kind of make it clear because it, it actually drops you behind the eight ball and you will wind up paying the piper in subsequent years. Um, I can't remember what page it was on, but uh, there is there was a chart showing 1.1% um, this year and then uh, next it's year fine. and each year thereafter projected. Yeah. I believe it's on page 60. Yeah. Page 60. Andrew, you're on the ball, buddy. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah. So 1.9, 1. 1. 10.2. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're doing good things this year, and I get it because of how desperate the, the situation is. But um, I just want to make sure that, that our taxpaying public is aware that down the line, you wind up um, having to make it up somewhere. Absolutely. Just a, com just a comment. Yeah, 
I, I think that's really important. And, and those numbers, um, you know, obviously they can change, but um, we're going to be starting from a lower point next year. Um, so this really changes the picture of, um, of where we would have been at next year. Um, the costs that we have don't go away. So um, we've made, you know, a lot of changes to try to reduce things this year. But um, it, like you say, it, it has to be paid for somewhere. And um, it unfortunately just me it does mean a likely a larger increase next year. Councillor Washington. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, it's all going to be a trickle down theory because the monies that both federal and provincial governments are giving away once uh, things clear up, I I'm afraid that they're going to be looking for it to come back to them too. So uh, what we're getting now, uh, we're going to end up paying for later. Everybody right down to the, the, the average householder who went on EI or something like that, or took some kind of funds from the government, we're going to have to pay it back somehow. Absolutely. Thank you. Councillor Poon, did you have a comment? No, I've got nothing to add at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Haggard, anything? No, Madam Mayor. Councillor Solda? I think the only thing I wanted to add, when I had at the last meeting, um, I was kind of reflecting on the question you had asked the Chamber of Commerce regarding McLean's Mill about going, taking their budget down. And um, I think that should have been brought down a little. We have $40,000 times two in a contingency funds. And they were for like weddings and stuff. If they got canceled, they are canceled there. And it's no cost to the city. And I wonder if that $80,000 that we have do we necessarily need that fund? Could we not take it off the budget, the taxes for the community that would reduce it by another half percent? But it's just something that I have been thinking about since the last meeting, Madam Mayor. We've asked others to come down in their budget and it would have been great to do the same thing. That's all I need to say. Thanks, Madam. Thank you. Um, I'll just ask staff, um, maybe CAO, if there's um, if there's room in our portion of the McLean Mill budget to reduce at all, or what it would look like to reduce. Madam Mayor, um, I can't recall uh, off the top of my head what the city expenditures are anticipated to be in McLean Mill, um, but those expenditures will um, will not be affected by the operation of the mill. They're about about um, maintaining the fire alarm system, maintaining the fire pump, that kind of thing. So I don't um, see a, an ability for us to change the cost the city will incur there. Um, yeah, and our the only other way to do that would be to, um, we do have $30,000 in funding from the city earmarked for a capital project this year. Um, and it's leveraged by 30,000 from the regional district and an anticipated 60,000 from the federal government. So if we wanted to make a reduction there, we could do that, but we would also um, potentially lose the, the grant funding from the federal government. I, I think Councillor Solda was asking more about the contingency budget that we have in place for McLean Mill, additional to the operating budget um, that we have for our staff time and projects. We had a small, I think it was 30 or $40,000 contingency budget as well for unforeseen costs. And I recall a contingency, uh, I believe 40,000 contingency for McLean Mill that would be accessed um, either by the city or by, by, um, by the chamber if they, had un if they incurred un unforeseen costs. And they've incurred some to date, but, um, but not beyond what we anticipated. But if you wanted to bring that number down, you could. We could bring that number down and um, we would be exposed to the potential that if those unforeseen costs run beyond what the number is we bring it down to, we would have to um, draw from the city's general contingency to cover those costs. So you could bring Matt, it down. Yeah, I, th I think what I'm hearing Councillor Solda ask um, and, and what I'm understanding her rationale to be is that um, because the $150,000 contract we have with the chamber was not reduced, even though their business plan has drastically changed. Yes. Um, and, you know, they've kind of said, well, there might be unforeseen costs and, and which is understandable given that they're not going to have the revenues, but they also are not going to have some of the expenses. I think Councillor Solda is asking, 
um, can we then get rid of our contingency because we've left them room in their budget? Councilor Solda, am I filling that up? Oh, you're doing a damn good job. Oops, sorry, we're on. <laughs> yes, yes, you are. And it, it's just, you know, like, um, if you don't have the money, don't spend it, right? I mean, if the if if you've topped your budget, what are you going to do? You're not going to spend. It's just like at home. So I, I just think we need to take a look at that. So, Councillor Solda, um, we are about to do uh, more readings of our budget. Um, we, if you want to make a motion, um, I would imagine we could um, move third reading and then do an amendment. Um, sure. Are I would agree able, with that. Are you able to tell us though, like, so if we reduce that, um, I mean, uh, the risk is that there are more unforeseen costs um, and then we would be possibly dipping into our contingency. Is that correct, CAO? Madam Mayor, um, I, I apologize. I, I don't know which budget line we're talking about at this point. So I can't give you advice on this. If you, if, if council directs uh, a reduction in budget, um, and if if it, if during the year we incur costs, we'll have to ask council to um, take those from a different contingency. Yes. So in general, yes, but I, I don't know which specific line is being referred to here. Okay, Madam Mayor, there's yeah. two forty thousand. I thought there was two forty thousand. One was forty thousand. If there had been some unknown cost from um, the Chamber of Commerce. And then there was another contingency fund I thought we had for $40,000. Am I incorrect on that? I think you're correct, Councillor Solda. Um, and, and I um, really agree with your um, thought process on reducing um, that contingency. I had really wanted to see a reduction from the chamber in our operating agreement. Yes. And I understand their process, their thought process around why they can't. Um, like our budget has, everything has changed, so has theirs. Um, but I do think that this is one area that we may be doubling up and I would be supportive of reducing it. And the other thing too, Madam Mayor, the con there's two contracts with the Chamber of Commerce. Chamber of Commerce does the tourist and information that we pay them for, their service. And then of course now the contract with McLean's Mill. So they're two separate. So we can't, they can't be mushed together. They, they have to be two separate businesses, right? In, in, or, so I just want that to be clear. So um, I definitely think we need to take that one down, the two contingency funds. I don't care if we have $20,000 left in one, but we should take it down. Thank you. I do have a couple um, hands that have gone up. So uh, Councillor Poon and then Councillor Haggard. I, I, I understand uh, Councillor Solda's rationale on this, uh, but I feel that we really shouldn't be shaping the budget so tightly. And, you know, if we end up having to dip into contingency next year, then it, it's really not, uh, it kind of defeats the purpose of shaping this budget now. So um, I feel like we should just maintain it as it is now. Thank you. Thank you. I think someone else had a hand up. Did I miss? Okay, nobody's putting a hand up. Uh, Councillor Washington. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, budgets are merely guidelines. Um, if it doesn't get spent this year, uh, we've got it for next year when we're gonna have a 10% tax increase. So we'll need all the help we can get next year too. So, uh, I, I think, like Councillor Poon said, I think we should just uh, let it ride and uh, if they don't spend it, it'll be left over for next year. Councillor Corbiel. Well, I agree with Councillor Solda that uh, when we signed the contract with the Chamber, it was a different world. Uh, we had anticipated there would be a number of uh, people going out to McLean's Mill and uh, the way things sit now. I suspect if that happens at all, it'll be uh, mid to late summer. So I, I, I too felt that uh, the chamber had room to uh, move on their budget. As I say, we had signed a contract, so I guess we were kind of stuck there. But if we have the ability to shave back the contingency fund, I think we should. 
Thank you. Before I go to Councillor Solda, I'm just going to ask if the CAO or Director of Finance um, have been able to find the amount of that contingency. I only remember from the um, report when we originally signed the contract, we, um, I, I seem to remember it was something like 75,000 between the two. So 35 roughly for contingency and 40,000 for our expected operating costs to maintain the historic portion of the site. Yeah. Madam Mayor, I'm looking at the budget. Um, I see $40,000 um, for anticipated city costs and why those would be changed um, from COVID or not because they're, they're just related to maintaining the infrastructure and paying some of the recurring bills. Um, and that is $150,000 for the operating agreement with the chamber. Um, and uh, we we did hear the chamber at your last meeting and um, and the topic I don't think came up about or they were the chamber was not if they would if they could um, reduce the budget. It was discussed, but there was no um, I don't think there was any direct ask. Um, we don't have the ability to unilaterally reduce the terms of that agreement with the chamber. So if council wants to make a reduction of a claim mill, um, you can make it in the $40,000 or if you made it in the $40,000 at the city it anticipates incurring costs, then we're going to be underfunded in that line and we'll be back to you mid-year looking for contingency funds. There's also, as I recall, $40,000 in contingency specific to McLean Mill and um, the director of finance might correct me on that or the director of parks, rec and heritage. Um, I, and I really have no context to be able to give you advice on that, whether you can reduce it or not. If you choose to reduce it now, um, then it just, it, what it really means is that if we're exposed to costs that we didn't anticipate, we'll have to um, source those from a, the general contingency. So it's, it's, not, it's not that you can't do it, it's just um, it, you know, we might be dipping into general contingency later in the year. And I just don't, I can't give you advice beyond that. Thank you, Director of Finance, anything to add? Um, just make sure I'm on here. Sorry. Um, so, Madam Mayor, I think, you know, we're at the point here where we we, we are, are, are looking at trying to adopt the, the financial plan. Um, if we if we take a different direction and make a change, we would be having a special meeting uh, next week in order to adopt the financial plan and then have our tax bylaw adopted. Uh, that being said, I think if we could work with uh, the Chamber of Commerce and, and, and find a way to to review what costs they have incurred throughout the year. And then when we look at, at future years, as far as the agreement, we could possibly have uh, any changes or any, any amendments uh, associated with the future years uh, and work towards that. We do see that 10.2% 10, 10 as Councillor uh, Paulson uh, mentioned. So if we find a way to, to work towards the goal of, of getting uh, fair, fair value for tax dollars, I think we can see uh, what Councillor Solda uh, had, had, had intended. Thank you, Councillor Solda. And then I'll ask um, City Clerk about process. So Madam Mayor, $650,000 is sitting on the hotel that just went down. And um, we don't know what's gonna cost there. If there's leftover money, we're still got money. We don't have to go into a special contingency fund, I believe. So uh, again, we don't know if we have to replace pipes and that on the $650,000 that's sitting there that we have marked, earmarked for the hotel. That is um, land sale reserve funds. Um, so that's typically would not be for- um, You're right. Overspending on McLean Mill. But I think your point is there are other funds if needed. Um, so I'm just gonna ask the city clerk, um, if Councillor Solda would like to um, not request new information, but make a specific um, amendment to the budget. Could we move um, third reading and then make an amendment to third reading, reducing um, that specific budget? Um, and if that passes, adopt the budget as amended. Or would we need a special meeting? So if I'm not sure if Davina wanted to address. Sure, Madam Council Mayor, if, um, if, if Council wishes to amend um, at third reading and, and give third reading again to the five-year financial plan, we would not request that Council adopt the five-year financial plan. You don't have a correct um, five-year financial plan in front of you. Um, so we would bring that forward 
at a special meeting, at which time you would then consider tax rates as well. Any changes today will mean that you won't consider the tax rates by law. Okay, thank you. So should we move third reading? And then if, um, if she would like to make an, an amendment, do that as an amendment? It would be third reading as amended, Madam Mayor. Okay, thank you. Councillor Solda, I'll let you read um, third reading. And then if you choose to make uh, move an amendment, you can do that after. Thank you. Madam Mayor, if we can have the what the specific change might be, yeah. and then we would do third reading as amended. So a motion from council regarding the specific change. Oh, this is the opposite way that we do it at the regional district. <laughs> okay, so you want a motion about the change yeah. and ignore third reading for now. And then it would be third reading as amended. Okay, thank you. Councillor Salva. Wow. <laughs> okay, so let's let's try this. Okay, I move that we amend the budget and remove the forty thousand dollars contingency fund for McLean's Mill. Okay, does that sound fine? I will second that. Further conversation on this, Councillor Washington. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, to get into the budget and redo it at this late date is is that going to cost? How much staff time is that going to cost us? Is that uh, a lot of money to be spent on that as well? Madam Mayor, it would mean additional meetings of council as we still have to meet the May 14th deadline for our um, for tax rates to be adopted. So whatever changes you make at this point will re require further meetings. Um, so posting meetings, cre creating agendas, etc. Would it be one special meeting next week for instance or would there be additional meetings to that it could be one meeting it would be adoption of the five-year financial plan and then um, potential introduction and adoption of tax rates thank you councillor paulson um i just uh, i'm gonna i'm gonna vote against the amendment um and I, I kind of take to heart um, what our director of finance was saying. Um, uh, if we go through the year and we have a carryover into next year, it can be considered next year and potentially um, have a positive effect on what could be a monster year next year. Uh, I think we're, I concur with Councillor Washington. We're into this too far right now. Uh, and budgets are budgets. If we come in under budget, I think that's great. Thank you, Councillor Paulson. Councillor Councillor Haggard. Thank you. I agree with Councillor Paulson and Councillor Washington. I think it's too late in the game to start making changes now. It would be a lot of stuff no, to do that. Forty thousand dollars is it going to make a huge impact on the budget? And Councillor Solda always says she's a big one for contingency funds. So I think we should just leave it in there and hopefully it doesn't get used and we'll have extra money left on our budget for next year. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to speak um, in support of this. Um, I have I struggled from the start with um, with uh, moving forward in this way with McLean Mill. And although I, I really have gotten behind it and I really feel that um, given the right circumstances, um, the chamber and the people involved are absolutely um, the team to make the best use of this site. Um, that said, I have seen McLean Mill be a place that um, we we spend money and spend money and spend money, um, and nothing ever seems to come in less. And um, I, although I, I really did want um, the chamber to reduce their budget, I see what they have done is left themselves room for unforeseen costs. Um, in a budget year where they have had a lot of ups uh, or where they expect to have, you know, a lot more costs and less revenues. I feel that they have not reduced their contract price because they're making room for those things. And um, I find it difficult to um, leave contingency in our budget where I feel there's already contingency um, being left in their budget. So I feel like the spirit of why we put this contingency in is no longer there given how the year has changed. So I support this for that reason, um, but I understand the other points that have been made as well. 
um, this is a difficult issue and will never stop being, well, I shouldn't say that. Hopefully one day it will stop being a difficult issue because hopefully it will be um, so successful that, you know, all of the animosity around it um, starts to fade away. And I, I do believe that the chamber um, is the group to do that, but this is the difficult year. And um, for me, I wanna get our budget as low as possible this year. So I understand all points of this. Um, Councillor Solda. And I concur with everything you just said, Madam Mayor, but I, and I am big on contingency funds. I believe in them. But in this case, we're, we are also looking at a very different world right now. And the lower we get the, the taxes down, I'm happier. And yes, next year, the, according to um, the, the, on the budget 221, it's high, but it always is. And we, you can always play. You, you move things around. You do things in the following years. So I just think the lower we get, because people are going to be hurting. And we know that from the industries and stuff like that and the businesses. So I just want to make it more viable. Thank you. Councillor Washington. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So the, the, the money that Councillor Sold is talking about, what, how much does that impact the, our, our, our tax increase? Is it going to take it down half a percent or the point one or where where does that leave our tax rate at the end of the day i think it would be like roughly a, a quarter percent um maybe andrew could I, I could put it in but i i i i don't like running on the fly here as far as uh inputting number just to, I, I like to make sure i review everything before i provide any comments I like to throw numbers out there. I think it's a quarter to a third of a percent, roughly. <laughs> we'll wait for a better answer from Director of Finance, um, Councillor Solda. If this gives you $150,000, if you took $150,000, that's 1%. So do your math from there. The other thing too is, um, where was I gonna go with this? This is not the first time we've come to a third reading of a budget where we had to come back. That's what we get paid the big bucks for, guys. Thanks. Don't say big bucks. People will think we actually make big bucks. <laughs> uh, any further comments on this? Okay, seeing none, um, we do have a motion on the floor to remove the $40,000 contingency from the budget. It's been moved and seconded, all in favor. All opposed, defeated. Thank you for the discussion. Okay, so with that, I think we can move, um, we can move third reading. Would somebody like to move third reading? Madam Mayor, I'd like to move that the five year financial plan bylaw 2020 to 2024 bylaw number 5003 be read a third time. Second. I'm back. <laughs> oh, home meetings. I have someone banging on my door. <laughs> Did somebody move for a uh, third reading? Moved and seconded. Wonderful. Um, thank you for that. Um, any further discussion on this? Okay, then I do want to say before we vote um, that I am really happy with um, this budget, although it is not at all what I wanted to see in this year's budget. Um, I am happy with how um, staff and council work to bring it down to where it is. And I think we should all be proud of um, where it's gotten to. So thank you to everyone for your work on it. On third reading, all in favor? Carried. And would you like to continue with final? Also, Madam Mayor, I'd like to move that the five-year financial plan bylaw 2020-2024, bylaw number 5003, be now finally adopted, signed by the mayor and clerk, sealed with a corporate seal and numbered 5003. Thank you, is there a seconder? Second. Perfect, and any further questions, comments? Seeing none, all in favor? Carried, or any opposed, sorry. None opposed, carried. And Councillor Paulson, if you would like to continue with tax rates, or I guess we could, uh, Boy. Andrew, do you have anything further to say on tax rates? Madam Mayor, I do have a couple little notes here, if you don't mind. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, so, um, you know, obviously we're, we're having uh, 
the three readings and adoption in front of council for for approval, uh, which is not normally how we conduct. So we usually have uh, uh, three readings and then come back with the adoption later. But obviously, with the COVID and the response that we've had across the province, the uh, the province has allowed us to have uh, this process undertaken at one meeting. So we're thankful for that. Of course, we had the uh, province announce the the delay of the of the tax deadline for commercial uh, properties in business. Uh, so classes four to eight are now looking at a due date of September 30th. What we also have in front of council is the, um, the option to consider a 5% uh, penalty on, on October 1st and, and, and a 5% penalty on December, 5th, uh, December 1st, sorry. And with that, it's trying to be in line with how we normally conduct our our penalty streams. Uh, some municipalities will take a 10% uh, penalty right off the uh, right off the first day that it's not uh, paid. So this is something that we're continuing to do uh, for our commercial businesses and uh, and in the class four to, to eight. So uh, we're looking for council support for that similar process. Um, so as mentioned earlier, the the increase is 1.1%. Um, cash flow is a concern, obviously, with um, the COVID impacting uh, our residents and our businesses, but we've been provided some tools as far as our, our cash flow, and that includes the $4 million that we've received for our uh, school district tax. That's not payable on August 1st. We can pay that to the province at the end of the year. We have the ac access to our reserve funds. Uh, some some are, are, are uh, restricted and some are, are not restricted, and this, uh, this current uh, process allows us now to have access to all our reserve funds so we can manage cash flow with that. And we, we also have the ability to borrow, which the City of Alberni does not normally do. And we can do a revenue anticipation bylaw of 75% of our total revenue that we anticipate. Uh, and, and we could borrow should we need to. And we can do that through our bank or through uh, the Municipal Finance Authority. Uh, and, and finally, I just wanna point out that non-market value uh, increases through BC assessment um, is, is one, one option that we can look at moving forward. Some municipalities will take that non-market value and assign that, that uh, increase in the tax revenue to uh, a special reserve fund. Uh, what we do is we, we dilute the, the impact on the taxpayer. So as you see, we have a 1.9% increase in our overall tax rate, in our overall taxes, but that only impacts our, our our residential property by 1.1%. So I'd like to bring forward a, a staff report in the future to address that and, and, and create some more understanding for council. And that's all I had, thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Paulson. Um, I, I just wonder if for the lay person, if we could go to page 100 of the agenda, this is probably for me and I don't quite get all the figures, but I wonder if you could just summarize uh, paragraph two and three on page 100 here, um, Andrew, just uh, so there's clarification on, on the percentages and the dollar values there as we move forward. Just, and this is for me, maybe everybody else understands it, but um, just a bit of clarity. So Madam Mayor, I believe that was paragraphs two and three. On yeah, because I see a 1.07, I see a 1.1, 1 .1, um, I see some differences in, um, I see a 311,000 as opposed to 291. Just um, for the lay person, maybe just <laughs> kind of what all those numbers mean. Certainly. Very, just yeah. summarize. Yeah, so, so with, with, uh, with the uh, council report that we brought forward on April the 14th, uh, it was noted that we had a 1.07% increase to the average single family resident. Whereas once we had our, our BC assessment revised rule, there's some, 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 some of the property owners would actually uh, appeal their, their assessment. And at that point, BC assessment might do some uh, rejigging of, of the total values in that class. So what happened is some of the values went down, which increases the, the impact on our, on our residential uh, properties. So that's why it's went up at 0.03%. When it comes to the, the value of the average single family property, where it was 315, I believe, uh, in, in the prior report, it's down to 311 uh, for a, a single family residence. So just some, some small tweaks, which 
impacts the, the tax rates per, per class. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, seeing none, Councillor Paulson. I'd like to move that uh, tax rates 2020 bylaw number 5008 be now introduced and read a first time. Is there a seconder? Second. Thank you. Any further comments? All in favor. Carried. I'd like to move that tax rates 2020 bylaw number 5008 be read a second time. I'll second that. Okay, and seeing no questions, all in favor. Any opposed? None opposed, carried. I'd like to move the tax rates 2020 bylaw number 5008 be read a third time. Second. Okay, and all in favor? None opposed, carried. I'd like to move the tax rates 2020 bylaw number 5008 be now finally adopted, signed by the mayor and clerk, sealed with a corporate seal and numbered 5008. I'll second that. Thank you. And last opportunity for questions. Seeing none, all in favor. Any opposed? None opposed, carried. And I'd also, continue oops, there. Sorry. I'd also like to move the council for the city of Port Alberni sets the penalty for late payment of taxes in two stages for class four, five, six, seven, and eight as follows. 5% immediately after the due date on October 1st, 2020, and an additional 5% on December 1st, 2020. Second. Thank you. And any comments on this? All in favor. Any opposed? None opposed, carried. Okay, thank you for that council. Moving on to correspondence for action. The first item is from Al or is a letter dated April 16th, 2020, inviting council from Alberni Valley Transition Town Society, inviting council to investigate ways to assist the community food security and suggestions on a resilient strategy, resilient strategy during COVID-19. I'm having a hard time reading today. Um, were there any questions on this? Okay, seeing none, Councillor Solda, would you like to read that motion? That's okay, um, Councillor Councillor Corbiel, maybe. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Mayor. I move that the letter dated April 16th, 2020 from the AVTTS inviting Council's consideration of implementing a few low or no cost strategies during COVID-19 be received. Second. And Council, I think there are some, um, some good concepts and ideas in here. And I think there's a bigger conversation to be had around food security. And I know it's something that I've had conversations with many of you about recently. It's definitely becoming more top of mind. So I think this letter is a great start. Um, and I think we'll be bringing forward um, some more conversations in the very near future. Any further comments? Seeing none, all in favor. Carried. Next one is an email dated April 20th, and sorry, emails dated April 20th and 21st, 2020 from Rebecca Tarapaki expressing concern regarding the Third Avenue revitalization projects. And um, I'm not sure if Rebecca is aware, it was unclear in her letter that we are not moving forward with this project this year unless um, we get grant funds to um, pursue the project. So would somebody like to move receipt? Council. So we've met Thank I'll, you. I'll Thank move you. that, Madam Mayor. <laughs> Thank you. And seconded by Councillor Poon. Um, any co comments? Seeing none, all in favor. Carried. And the third item is a letter dated April 20th, 2020 from the Vancouver Island Construction Association and the Canadian Home Builders Association, Vancouver Island, advising that due to COVID-19 construction companies are facing many challenges and therefore are asking that fairness and consideration be guiding principles when dealing with, sched with schedule and cost impacts experienced by contractors on municipal contracts. Somebody like to move receipt. So moved, Madam Mayor. Okay, and seconded by Councillor Solda. Any comments on this? Okay, seeing none, all in favor. 
carried. And fourth, from a copy of a letter dated April 21st, 2020 from the District of Saanich to the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing requesting the reinstatement of the Financial Hardship Property Tax Deferment Program. I'm gonna move receipt of this and request that we, um, that we send um, a similar letter to the ministry following up on this request. Is there a seconder? Second I'll is second that. Holda. And I'll just comment that um, I actually, until I read this letter, was unaware that this program um, had existed, but I have had conversations with the provincial government, um, with our MLA and other ministers recently, pushing for expansion of the existing um, property tax deferment programs um, and suggested creating a COVID-19 property tax deferral stream. Um, and it's great to see that there's actually already a framework in place that has been used in the past. The existing programs allow seniors to defer their taxes and um, with very little um, restrictions. And they also allow um, young families to defer their taxes, albeit with many more restrictions and at a higher cost, unfortunately. Um, but they're both good programs, and but there's certainly a gap. Um, anyone without a young family or who is not 55 plus doesn't have the option to defer property taxes. So it would be great to see this program reestablished. Um, and I would love to see us follow up that request because I think it's really important at a time like this for someone going through financial hardship because of COVID-19 to be able to apply to defer their property taxes. And that would be through the provincial government, not through the municipal government. Any comments, Councillor Poon? Thank you. I think for sure, I, I really do agree with you. And um, we need to have uh, a wider, I guess, a recognition of a wider variety of needs. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Seeing no more comments um, on the motion to receive and write our own letter, all in favor. Carried. And moving on to item five, which is a letter dated April 22nd, 2020 from Roland Smith requesting information and clarification regarding city processes and the contractual relationship between the city of Port Alberni and the Alberni Valley Chamber of Commerce regarding McLean Mill National Historic Site. CAO, do you want to speak to this at all? Uh, yes, please, Madam Mayor. Uh, Mr. Smith's um, submission has um, four questions at the end. Um, two of those, um, Deputy Clerk, the Deputy Clerk is prepared to respond to um, now, uh, verbally, and questions three and four, um, Mr. Smith is asking for counsel to speak to, speak to the, you know, uh, what your, what your train of thought was when you made decisions around budget. I, I don't think that staff are in a position to respond to questions three and four, and so if counsel would like to, um, those are there. But um, the Deputy Clerk can speak now to questions one and two. Sure. Thank you. And yes, Madam Mayor and Council, what I was going to add uh, in response to question one and two was uh, referring to the request that re was received from Mr. Smith uh, dated April 8th, at which time he was asked to follow up uh, with a formal FOI request, given uh, the information he was requesting was pertaining to an RFP. So uh, following that, his subsequent letter dated today and or dated April 22nd and in council's package. The reason he was asked to follow up with a formal RFP was this is to allow staff to carry out a careful analysis of the information that's being requested, as well as apply interpretation of the FOI Act. Uh, in this case, there could be uh, interests of a third party that may be affected. So in addition to staff indicating that a formal response to Mr. Smith's questions be provided in writing, staff proposed to prepare a report that speaks to uh, the FOI process and things of that nature and provide that information to council at a regular meeting in May. Thank you very much. Councillor, are there any follow-up questions on that? Councillor Sola. But Madam Mayor, in the past, haven't we released information on contracts that we have with other um, societies and different things? I don't, 
it's just kind of weird. Okay. I'm just kind of asking, we've released before, so I don't know. And I remember at the last meeting, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, CAO did say, if, I think when Mr. Smith spoke, there was, um, if we wanted to release the information, he said, it's up to council, am I? CAO. Madam Mayor, um, Councilor Sold is correct. When, when asked, I did say that the, the, the submissions to RFPs um, were publicly available documents and um, the clerk's department has done some further investigation and determined that the, the process by which those documents are made available is through an FOI process, not just um, brought forward to an agenda of council. That might be the case for tenders, but not for RFPs. So um, as the deputy uh, clerk has suggested, she can bring a, a written report to your next meeting or a meeting in May that explains that um, because a lot of this verbal response to questions um, I think is contributing to the ambiguity of some of these issues. Thank you for that. Any follow-up question from Councillor Solda? No. Oh, okay. Um, would any members of council like to speak to um, questions three and four? They are really around, you know, what is what was our thought process when we made the decision? So I'm not sure I can really answer on behalf of council. Um, there's one question in there that that compares the hundred and ninety thousand dollars that we spent on the on McLean Mill um, with a much lesser amount that we spent thirty minutes talking about, and it appeared that we had um, given really no consideration or no time um, discussion to the hundred and ninety thousand dollars. And and I would say that for me, um, that is because we've been talking about this um, for many months. So at that meeting, we may have spent more time talking about $13,000. Um, but we've been talking about this for probably nine months um, from start to finish talking about route and if we wanted to go RFP or if we wanted to separate the historic site and, and so many other factors. So um, the cumulative time that we have spent talking about this would be significant. And I, I think it's it's a bit unfair to single out one specific meeting and, and call that our dialogue. Um, Councillor Corbiel. Well, if I could, Madam Mayor, you know, one of the differences, I guess, is uh, we were in a contractual agreement with the chamber and we had hoped that there would be some relaxation of, of the contract versus uh, uh, the aquarium, as you point out, this was new to us and uh, and uh, we didn't have the luxury of uh, months and months of, of discussion. Absolutely. Thank you. Councillor Haggard. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, it appears that the author of this letter has lumped all the, these three examples all as one, but they're three very different uh, examples. One is a society asking for operating funds. One is a lease agreement and the other one is an RFP. So they're, they're very three different examples. So they're not the same and he expects them to be treated the same. So if they're not the same, they should not be treated the same. So, and as you said, we spent considerable amount of time talking about McLean Mill through other meetings and, and we're still talking about it and we're gonna <laughs> talking about it forever, but just I was going to say, we never stopped talking about it. <laughs> no. So I think Ms. Uh, Mr. Smith needs to understand the differences between the society asking for money, a lease agreement and RFP. Maybe he's not understanding the three different examples he's given us. I, I think he does understand for sure. Um, but I think that there's been um, a bit of um, back and forth on this as it is all new. Um, and, uh, you know, a question was asked um, if it would be public or not. Um, and I think now there's clarity of it can absolutely be public, but this is the process it needs to go through to be public. Um, and, and I think given our earlier conversation about um, the contingency today, we have um, already had quite a bit of conversation related to um, kind of some of what's in his in his questions as well. Um, and I'm going to assume he is watching and we may get another question from him during question period. So um, we will welcome that if he chooses to submit for question period as well. Any further comments from Council on this? Okay, um, so seeing no further comments, um, Councillor Solda, would you like to read the motion that's there? Uh, 
Madam Mayor, I move that the letter from Roland Smith requesting information and clarification regarding city processes and the contractual relationship between the city of Port Alberni and the Alberni Valley Chamber of Commerce regarding the McLean Smith National Historical Site be received and that council direct staff to respond to Mr. Smith's question in writing and how he can get the information from in camera. Thank you. Is there a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Washington. Seeing no further comments, all in favor? Carried. And item six in correspondence for action is a letter dated April 22nd, 2020, advising that due to COVID-19, the United Steel Workers Local 1-1937 will not be hosting the day of mourning ceremony this year and requesting that the city fly the National Day of Mourning flag at half mast on April 28th and throughout the following week and observe a moment of silence on April 28th. Would somebody like to make this motion? Councillor Corbiel. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I would like to move that the letter dated April 22nd, 2020, advising that due to the COVID-19 the United Steelworkers Local 1-1937 will not be having a day of mourning ceremony this year and requesting that the city fly the National Day of Mourning flag at half mass on April 28th and throughout the following week and observe a minute of silence on April 28th be received and council direct staff to fly the National Day of Mourning flag and observe a minute of silence on April 28th. Second. Seconded by Councillor Poon. Um, seeing no comments, all in favor? Carried. No proclamations. Um, so City Clerk, um, on to correspondence for information, if you could read those out. Yes, we have four items uh, for information. One being a news release from the Ministry of Finance and Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing, outlining a number of supports for businesses, local governments as a result of COVID-19. We have correspondence from the Union of British Columbia Municipalities acknowledging receipt of Council's resolution, which was intended to be considered by the Association of Vancouver Island Coastal Communities at their conference in 2020, but due to COVID was cancelled. So this resolution will be brought forward at the 2020 UBCM convention in September for consideration if that convention moves forward. We have another piece of correspondence from Diabetes Canada. Due to COVID, it has resulted in temporary layoffs and bin closures. So they're looking to local governments to help discourage donations, albeit temporarily at this point, and also to help in removing garbage and soil donations that are being left at the bins. And then lastly, you have a letter from Scott Green, 2020 chairman of the Alberni District Fall Fair advising that the fall fair slated for mid-September 2020 is canceled due to COVID. Thank you. Um, and are there any items people would like to speak to here? Councillor Washington. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, just item for the, the fall fair association of the fall fair. I know that was a, a big decision they had to make and um, it's not good, but uh, there's, there's always next year. And uh, right now, just sort of in that same loop, the, the Port Alberni Salmon Festival is uh, probably not gonna happen. They're trying to figure out how to have a derby without a festival. And then I was trying to figure out how to weigh in fish without touching the distancing. So um, I think probably the, the Salmon Festival will follow the suit of the Fall Fair and Days Thunder in the Valley and all the rest of the things that are going on this year. Thank you. Yeah, I think we're coming up to a very difficult um, string of our favorite community events, um, all starting to announce their cancellations. And um, as difficult as this time has been, I think that um, we're also connected to these events that go on, whether you participate in them or volunteer at them. Um, they're such a source of community pride and it will be certainly difficult to, um, to see these events canceled. And I know when I saw the 
the notification that fall fair was being canceled. I don't know why it really hit me more than anything else. I was like, no fall fair. Um, it just is, you know, it's, it's a piece of our community as are so many of these other events that go on. So um, definite appreciation going out to all of the volunteers and organizers that are having to make these difficult decisions. It's because you like the ride so much. I, I really do. Yeah, I really do. <laughs> Any other comments? Councillor Solda. Yeah, Madam Mary, I think there's a fund that the government has put out that societies can tap into for revenues they might lose because of the, the virus. And I think some of these um, societies could apply for that because there's no event and it's gonna, there's a cost there too. Absolutely. For sure. And we will um, do our best um, to pass that information along as we are um, in co contact with these groups and able to, um, we can certainly keep providing information. And um, again, we want to make sure that certainly we don't lose any of these events long term. So yeah, thank you for that. Would somebody like to move receipt of the correspondence? Moved by Councillor Solda. Is there a seconder? Second, Madam Mayor. Seconded by Councillor Corbeil. All in favor? Carried, thank you. Um, no report from in camera and on to council reports. Any items people would like to, people would like to speak to? Councillor Haggard. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I just wanna talk a little bit about social procurement. Um, we really have to look at every RFP that we release and look at every bid to see how it's gonna help our community. Uh, right now, social procurement is even more important, more relevant than ever before. So uh, I, we need to really start looking at implementing a social procurement policy sooner rather than later. I know we've been on this committee for about a year now, I think, and we really have it progressed. So we need to start moving forward. Uh, I'm going, I've been to a workshop. I uh, participated in a three-hour uh, uh, panel uh, last week and I'm going to another workshop this week virtually and another one more towards the end of the month. So hopefully uh, as Andrew is getting more settled in and more um, sort of getting the budget process out of the way and then working through the audit, maybe he can start working on this as well. Thank you. Councillor Haggard, I think that's a really fantastic point. Um, social procurement and local employment and all other benefits, um, you know, that can be realized locally are far more important now and will be in the coming months um, than they ever have been before. And especially as we talk a lot about, um, you know, how our when we we start looking at or trying to get grant funds to do these large projects. Um, I think we want to be able to demonstrate that um, we have a process in place to ensure that we're getting local benefit um, or the, you know, the most extent of local benefit. Um, so I think we should be looking at um, updating our procurement policy sooner rather than later. And maybe we could um, have a motion with receipt of these reports to get an update on um, an update or, or a plan for what the process is to do that um, at a council meeting in the near future. Any other items people would like to speak to? Councillor Paulson. I just wanted to comment that um, uh, in my report, um, we missed the Alberta Clackwood Continuing Care Society meeting last month, but we're going to have a go at a virtual meeting tomorrow. And I'll be looking forward to getting an update on Echo Park and Fur Park Village um, uh, with regards to the current situation we're in with COVID-19. Uh, we've been really lucky with our senior care centers here in Port Alberni from what I understand, but uh, that meeting will be happening tomorrow. Thank you for that. Any further items? Okay, um, Councillor Haggard, would you like to move receipt? Um, and if you'd like to request a report on um, a process for Social procurement, you see how you can word that. I don't know. <laughs> and Councillor Haggard, you are muted. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'd like to move that the council reports outlining recent meetings and events relating to the city's business be received. Thank you. Is there a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Solda. 
All in favor? Carried. And, and I'd like to move that uh, staff start working towards uh, uh, implementing and uh, writing a social writing and implementing a social procurement policy moving forward. Thank you. Does that sound all right or? That sounds, sounds okay. possible for sure. <laughs> it's been a long meeting. <laughs> Thank you. And that's been seconded by Councillor Paulson. Um, any comments on this? So of course staff will bring us back um, a report on what that will look like. Um, and then we'll start, um, hopefully council can direct to start working on it. Um, so the first step will be getting a report. Um, okay, on the motion, all in favor. Any opposed? None opposed, carried. Thank you very much. Um, any new business item or councillors would like to um, bring forward as motions or notice of motions? Seeing none, uh, question period. Have we received any questions? Uh, yes, Madam Mayor, we have. Um, the first is from John Adams, who lives on Batty Road. Madam Mayor and Council, a month ago, you decided to contact the federal government to see if they had jurisdiction at McLean's Mill. In particular, if they had jurisdiction that would trump or void the BC Agricultural Land Commission mandate to enforce its regulations. Have you got an answer from the federal government? And if so, can you elaborate on this issue? And then there's a second question. Okay. When is the city going to take action on the dam issue at McLean's Mill? Will there be a new offering of contract for bids? Is there a timeline in which you hope to complete this project? Thank you for that question, John. Um, as CAO, I'm sure you could speak to both of those questions. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, on the first question, um, the city has not reached out to the federal government. Um, we have taken legal advice on that matter. And uh, as council is aware, you directed that um, we make application to the Agricultural Land Commission for permissions to, um, to undertake the activities we already were undertaking at the play mill. That application, um, the deadline for it is, is later this week. And uh, we think we'll be able to have that submission in prior to the deadline. Um, as for uh, the, the McLean Mill Dam issue, um, Council just uh, gave their reading and adoption to the budget, and that budget included funding for the dam project. And as Council directed, um, I believe back in December, um, that we retender that project um, within the next six months, I believe was the direction. So we'll be retendering that project shortly. And um, hopefully, uh, with the intention of undertaking that work um, this summer or fall. And that'll depend on a number of variables, but uh, the, the money is in the budget now, and um, it's our intention to to seek bids on the work. Thank you. Have we received any other questions? Uh, yes, we have, Madam Mayor. Uh, one from Neil Anderson in regards to the Kingsway Hotel. Okay. Do we have to have Councillor Solda, or sorry, Councillor <laughs> Poon, recuse herself for, from the question? Um, she may wish to, as she has previously declared a conflict of interest, so I would suggest that she does. Okay, Councillor Poon. Um, as I previously indicated, I do have a conflict of interest, um, so I will recuse myself at this time. Thank you, Councillor Poon. And Madam Mayor, the question is, would Mayor Minions and our council please elaborate on the reasons the city and WorkSafe BC have posted a stop work order on the two-year renovation project at the Kingsway Hotel? This project has been ongoing for over two years. Why are the permits only being applied for now, near the end of a two-year project and not prior to start of the reno project? So I don't believe there is a stop work order on the building currently, but CAO, maybe you could um, answer that question. Yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor. And while the question asked for council uh, or the mayor to respond, um, you wouldn't have situational awareness over this. It's an operational matter. Um, I, I can tell you as was presented to you in a report at your last meeting, I believe um, when the city became aware of, of a possible renovation underway at Kingsway Hotel, our uh, building official attended began to engage with the owner and um, regarding the, the likely need for a building uh, permit to be in place. And uh, COVID-19 got in our way um, in terms of having on-site inspections and that sort of thing. Uh, this past week and a bit ago, week and a half ago, the city received further information that, um, that uh, renovations might still be underway there. 
So our building official attended the scene, the site, and um, while not going into the building, saw um, adequate evidence of ongoing renovation. So the city put a stop work order on that, um, posted it on the building that no work was to continue, no renovation work. And um, subsequent to that, the uh, owner, um, a structural engineer to supervise the renovation and um, has applied for and received a building permit from the city. So the city um, has a building permit issued for that project for the structural work that's, that's underway there. Um, as far as uh, the question, why, why was a permit not applied for prior? Um, that's a really a question for the owner, um, not for the city. The city responded when we became aware of it, as we would with any other builder or any other building owner. Thank you for that. Um, we'll wait for Councillor Poon to join us again. My husband chose the noisiest food to eat in the background of our council meeting, in case anyone is wondering. <laughs> Um, Madam Mayor, we've received um, an additional question um, from Roland Smith. Uh, actually, two questions. So the first one, Fall Fair cancelled, Salmon Fest cancelled, PNE cancelled, and so forth. Island communities are petitioning Bonnie Henry to direct BC Ferries to further res restrict travel. If this city supports the petition to have Bonnie Henry restrict travel on BC Ferries and the claim mill needs people to travel and gather for events, how will people get here? And how does it continue to make sense to fund McLean Mill with $190,000 this season? And question two, does it still make sense to fund the Travel and Visitor Information Centre for the full amount of $87,000 this season when we don't want people to travel to the island? Hey, oh, maybe you could comment on our contractual agreement. Sure, Madam Mayor. Um, as we discussed earlier in the meeting, um, the city is, is, uh, has agreed to a, an operating agreement with the Chamber of Commerce um, for McLean Mill, so we're, we're bound to that. We also have an operating agreement um, for the Chamber to uh, operate a, a visitor centre, um, as they do at, up at the, high, the junction of the highway and, and Redford Extension. Um, neither of those uh, agreements, to my knowledge, allow us to unilaterally, unilaterally um, reduce the amount that is paid. Um, in either case, um, the city could have a conversation with the chamber. We already have had around the McLean Mill. If council wants to have a conversation with the chamber around their activities at the visitor center given COVID-19, we could do that. Um, I'm aware that they've um, been active on, uh, in terms of online engagement and um, seeking to uh, be ready to recover um, actual travelers when, when things are relaxed more. Thank you for that. Any follow-up questions or comments from council? Okay, seeing none. Any other questions? There are no other questions today, Madam Mayor. Okay, thank you. Would somebody like to move adjournment then? Moved by Councillor Paulson, seconded by Councillor Solda, all in favor? Carried, thank you so much.